This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. It is four minutes after ten and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC on a day when... You know, I mean, you think you've seen it all before, don't you? Uh, what do they say? There's nothing new under the sun. Or well, if you hang around lo- long enough, everything comes back into fashion. I don't know. And, and, and I've, I've been, you know, in this job or, or my previous jobs uh, for quite a long time now. And, and I've witnessed some fairly, some fairly r- rum shenanigans, if, you, if you'd allow me to turn into uh, a PG Woodhouse character just for a moment. There's some very rum shenanigans going on there, Jeeves. I, but, but this story is absolutely breath. I, no, I'm going to go in early. Sorry. If you've been paying attention this week, you'll know what word I'm trying to excise from my vocabulary or at least reduce, but sometimes it's the only word that will do. This story is absolutely extraordinary. Uh, Conservative MP, or, or suspended Conservative MP, technically I suppose he's no longer an MP, called Mark Menzies, who hadn't troubled the score as much Preview. God, I have turned into a PG Woodhouse character. Where did that phrase come? Hadn't troubled the scorers much. He hadn't troubled the scorers much previously. Stands accused of, I mean, all manner of misdemeanours and misbehaviours. And what's most remarkable about it is that the scandal has been known to the party bigwigs who've been trying to turn Angela Rayner's 10-year-old sale of a council house, that ex-council house, that may have involved um, the failure to pay one or two thousand pounds in, in, in capital gains tax. They have been trying to inflate that great big nothing burger on a daily basis with the help of client media, of course, all the client journalists queuing up to make a fool of themselves again in exactly the same way they did over Keir Starmer's curry, while knowing that a, a, a Tory MP was, was literally caught up in what can only be described in the finest of tabloid traditions as a drugs and rent boy scandal. It's even, did you know, it's even got an immigration angle. And, and the immigration angle is, uh, according to the Daily Mirror, um, and I, 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 I presume this headline uh, uh, supports the story that follows, but according to the Daily Mirror, Tory MP's rent boy lover was in Britain illegally after being refused entry three times. Mark Menzies under pressure to reveal what he knew about Brazilian male prostitute uh, Rogério Santos's immigration status. So it's even got an immigration angle, this story. But, of course, if, if you consume some corners, if you rely upon some corners of the UK media for your political news, you will know next to nothing about this and everything about a house that Angela Rayner sold in 2000 and. 13, I think, was it? No, 2015, uh, on which she may or may not have been due to pay some capital gains tax that she probably didn't know about. And even if she was due to pay it, as Matthew Paris, the former Conservative MP, wrote in the House of Commons yesterday, uh, in the in the uh, Times newspaper yesterday, it would be a, an absolute heap of beans, an absolute nothing burger. Anyway, seven minutes after ten. So here's my problem, and I don't expect you to feel unduly sorry for me, but I can't, I can't get a phone in out of this. How do you get the, how do you get a phone in out of a drugs and rent boy scandal? I could talk about it for the best part of half an hour. I could fill you in on all the grisly details, but at the end of that, I don't think that a question. Sometimes you may have noticed this during our time together. Sometimes I, I do start thinking that this isn't a phone-in. I don't normally start at 10 o'clock thinking that this isn't a phone-in. But I might introduce something into the conversation a little later and think to myself, well, I'll just share my thoughts on this, but I don't think it's going to be one of those stories where I invite you to, to share yours. But I, 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 I can't. And usually, Sometimes I get to the end of my own contemplations and explanations and I find unexpectedly that a, a helpful question, a felicitous invitation to you to ring in has presented itself, has popped up unexpectedly. I can't see it happening with this. I mean, not least it is still largely in the realms of allegation, although allegations considered serious enough to prompt a suspension. Um, the misusing, I mean, the, the, I will, I, I have to. But listen, this isn't, we're going to do a phone in about how hard it is to get hold of medicine. Okay, so hold on to your horses for that. He, he, it's the middle of the night. I mean, he, the Times have written it up like a, like, a, like a sort of, like a John le Carré novel. 
The phone call came in the dead of night. You can't normally write that in a news story. The dead of night. That's like something from, from fiction, isn't it? No one says the dead of night in real life. So you don't sort of phone your mum, do you, in the dead of night? Or, 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 or oh, I caught the night bus. I caught the night bus home last night. Really? What time? Oh, it was the dead of night. It was the dead of... So that they've let the time... The Times have let their journalist, Billy Kemba, who's done a banging job on this, to coin a technical term. Um, they've let him loose with the old uh, lyrical... <laughs> liberties the phone call came in the dead of night are you on your own the man said with urgency in his voice again you never put that in a news story this is on page 12 of the times yeah i think i am going to be talking about this for a while so um apologies if you were waiting for a more traditional phone in the phone call came in the dead of night this is also my audition for doing other audio books i've done my own audio book which features a few accents or, or at least attempt at, at, at slightly mickey-taking interpretations of public figures' voices, but I haven't done one straight like I could do it, you know. The phone call came in the dead of night. Are you on your own? The man said with urgency in his voice. I've got in with some bad people and they've got me locked in a flat and they want £5,000 to release me. I've never heard Mark Menzies' voice. He probably sounds like Jacob Rees-Mogg, but that just seemed to fit the that seemed to fit the text that we are examining at the moment. The caller was Mark Menzies, fifty-two, the Conservative MP for Fylde in Lancashire, and a government trade envoy. Now, I I, well, I I am a great fan, as you know, of full disclosure, not just the podcast but the practice. So I should tell you, I don't like Fylde. Fylde routinely rob Kidderminster Harriers of both glory victory goals and players so i've got a bit of a bee in my bonnet about file they have over the last few years become something of a of a rival an arch rival to kidderminster harriers so i do want to get that front and center in case i allow it to influence my coverage of this story involving the current mp for filed um i like that uh, from jamie he asks was it a dark and stormy night james i mean they could almost have opened with that line in fact i'm going to i'm gonna i'm gonna slightly embellish the times coverage of this story it was a dark and stormy night the phone call came in the dead of it are you on your own the man said with urgency in his voice. I've got in with some bad people and they've got me locked in a flat and they want £5,000 to release me. The caller was Mark Menzies, 52, the Conservative MP for Fylde in Lancashire and a government trade envoy. Where is he a government trade envoy for? What do they think about this? I remember when they made Dominic Kavchinsky the government trade envoy for Outer Mongolia. You think I'm joking, but I'm not. Uh, just as an indication of how much the world turns, Dominic Kaczynski went to one of those weird NatCon conferences once, and he got told off by the party leadership for knocking about with weirdos and crypto fascists. And 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 these days, former cabinet ministers can go along to it without Rishi Sunak being prepared to say boo to a goose. He had rung his seventy-eight-year-old former campaign manager. This is at half past three in the morning. A woman whom the Times is not naming. Waking her in the night and asking her to hand over thousands of pounds from a bank account containing donations to the MP's campaign. There's two pages of this, so rest assured I'll be moving on a quarter past. But the allegations that follow, and the Times have clearly done their homework on this, involve the money being stumped up by a, a, a constituency office manager who told friends that she'd cashed in her ISA to get hold of it. By then, the sum had risen to £6,500. Later that day, having been rescued from the flat, the Times reports today, Menzies rang the woman again and told her he'd summoned one of his staffers to London to collect him from the flat, and on arrival, the junior staffer handed over his own money, thought to be a few hundred pounds, which Menzies said he owed to two other men. After, asked if he was... I'm reading this from the Times newspaper, not from, I don't know, a Jilly Cooper novel. Asked if he was concerned he could be blackmailed again. Menzies said he'd change his phone number. Uh, and the following day, on another call, he said he needed another £35,000 for medical bills. And when he was told there was no more money in the campaign funds bank account from which um, some of this cash would, would, would subsequently be secured, he, he replied apparently, oh, we'll raise some more. 
A source close to Menzies said the MP had met a man on an online dating website and gone to their flat before going with another man to a second address where he continued drinking. It was falsely claimed that he had been sick at one point and several people at the address then demanded £5,000, claiming it was for cleaning up and other expenses. The source said Menzies decided to pay them because he was scared of what would happen otherwise but didn't have the funds to transfer the money from his own savings and his aides gave him money, quotes, as friends who wanted to help and and on it goes on it goes on it goes but of course the the big political story of the moment is the fact that in 2015 uh, Angela Rayner sold a former council flat uh, uh, upon which point she may have been responsible for about 1500 quid in capital gains tax that is the indicator of... And you know why that story is in the news? In fact, I'm going to play you a little clip of the bloke who is responsible for this story being in the news. I am not really in a position to criticise people for many things. Having an enormous forehead is one of them. I am overly blessed in that department. Oddly, it's not as disproportionate as it used to be. I think my body has caught up with my head as the years have passed. But as a young boy, I was nicknamed Mekon, not always affectionately, by some of my peers. And, and, and therefore, I shouldn't really be one to throw stones in a glass house. But this bloke's head, this bloke's forehead, is, is almost as big as his embarrassment in the following clip from Sky News. I, I, I'll play you that, and then we'll have a little rest, and then I'll decide what we're going to do next. Are you, are you still with me at the back? Good. So this is the bloke who is responsible for reinflating the Angela Rayner nothing burger and getting the police involved to the point where I read that there are currently 12 officers investigating the offences that James Daly has brought to the uh, authorities' attention. So who better than James Daly to tell us exactly what the alleged offences are? And of course, as a deputy chairman of the Conservative Party one has to presume that he would be party to this story about Mark Menzies. You, I, I presume that that is a significant enough position to be in the room where it happens. So when they're talking about how desperate they are to keep this story away from the news, uh, to keep Mark Menzies away from, well, not to put too fine a point on it, illegal immigrant rent boys, uh, that, that, that he would be part of those conversations. So, you know, he is the man. He is your man. He is your go-to guy for finding out about the allegations against Angela Rayner because he is the man who has made them. Over to Sky News journalists Beth Rigby and Jane Secker, joined in the studio by James Daly and the Labour MP Chris Bryant. Richard Sinek made the point that perhaps Keir Starmer should spend less time reading books and encouraging his deputy leader to, to read the rules around tax returns. How concerned are you about... The, the, this new investigation to Angela Rayner. Well, what is the allegation? James, you're the person who's made the allegation. What is it that you're alleging Angela Rayner has done? The, um, the matter is with Greater Manchester Police, as they've confirmed. Um, you wrote to them they're to demand that matters. they investigate something. What did Chris, you ask them ask to you investigate? You, just you shout a bit louder, just so none of us can hear. Unlike Chris, who shouts and makes all sorts of public allegations, what I want to do is an allegation has been made to the police. The police are investigating that. Let's give them the time and the opportunity to do that, which I thought was the Conservative Party, uh, sorry, the Labour Party's position. What do you think she's done wrong? I've just answered that question, and um, this, this, this is typical of what we go here, but, but, shouting very loudly. But the what police... are your concerns? What are the concerns that you put to the police? There's, there's been information, I think, the Greater Manchester Police released, or certainly appeared to release, uh, to the Times, and that those, I think, are the broad framing of the, of the matters that they are considering. But, and you may disagree with this, Chris definitely, in the shouting, definitely disagrees with me, but I believe that the, the uh, Greater Manchester Police should be able to look into these allegations in the way that they think is appropriate. What are the allegations? I don't understand I, why, you won't, why, we, why you're, you're not comfortable saying Well, we clearly, have a different, we, we clearly have a different point of view. The, the allegations or the, the, uh, the matters that are being investigated are with the Greater Manchester Police. It is my view that rather than debating um, allegations in public, and rather than going through evidence or not evidence, we should allow the Greater Manchester Police to investigate these matters fully and thoroughly and let justice take its, take its course. Jo, sorry, can I just jump yeah. in? Jo, you, you wrote to the police. Did you not put concerns of allegations? Didn't you write to them about it? Am I misunderstanding? Absolutely. The... So what did you ask them? 
Why won't you say it? I asked. No. Well, th th this, this is it. Th th this is the difference of opinion, which clearly I am uh, in a minority in respect to this. I asked the police to investigate certain matters um, that were in the public domain regarding um, uh, the regarding certain things. My point is which I don't think is, is, a, is an unreasonable point, is that I want the police to be given the time and the space to be able to uh, investigate those matters. That was the Labour Party position. And that's my view, Beth. You may disagree with it, but that's I, my view. I, I'm, just, I'm just curious as to if you wrote to the police and you're, did you ask them to investigate tax matters? Did you ask them to investigate electoral role issues? That's all I... I think there are a number of matters, and I think that those some of the issues that you've raised there are included within that. But I don't want to I don't want to comment on a police investigation. The police are investigating these matters, and I want to allow them to do that without me as a politician commenting on what they should do or what they shouldn't do. Well, at least no one would have the uh, front to try to respond to questions about Mark Menzies by bringing Angela Rayner into it. It takes it the Times, it takes the newspaper then to actually bring this investigation to some kind of conclusion. That's well, the reality, often, isn't it? Uh, in a, in a, you know, quite often it is a, a journalist who uh, uncovers a wrongdoing. It, it seems to have been what's happened in the case of Angela Rayner as well with the um, but, the home. All right, uh, OK, I hear on that. Well. But, but, quite but, but, often but, the journalists but, are, the, are the answer to that. Ah, sorry, no, no, no one except Grant Shapps would try to turn a question about Mark Menzies and the illegal immigrant rent boys, the mysteriously redirected uh, party funds and sundry other scandals into a nothing burger involving Angela Rayner. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 22 minutes after 10 and now we'll start the programme proper. I, I just felt that that Mark Menzies story was so extraordinary and I use the word advisedly that um, it would have been remiss not to... Uh, not to not to open with it, but I but I didn't, as I suspected wouldn't happen. I didn't find myself edging towards an actual phoning question as, as, as the, the more we examined it, and and this is a much more by any objective measure, this is a much more important story. Uh, not only that, it's it's very very domestic. It's entirely homegrown, um, and and spares us perhaps the the the, the heartbreak and, and horror of contemplating matters Middle Eastern again. Um, drug shortages are a, and, and I'm quoting here from the Nuffield Trust, a, a health think tank, motivated, an independent expert. Do you remember independent experts? Seems almost cruel to bring independent experts into a conversation shortly after saying the words Grant Shapps or indeed James Daly. But independent experts describe a new normal being the unavailability of pharmaceutical drugs. This is a conversation about medicines, uh, not, not about illegal drugs or recreational drugs. Doctors, pharmacists, the NHS, and of course patients are unable to get their, un their usual medication. And if you want numbers, in 2020, 648 warnings were issued regarding supply problems for certain products last year that figure doubled to 1000 it's more than doubled to 1634 uh, the lead author of the nuffield trust's report says the rise in shortages of vital medicines from rare to commonplace has been a shocking development that few would have expected a decade ago um i think the key word here is exacerbated because brexit is the reason given by the independent experts for the exacerbation of already existing problems. Direct comparisons with, for example, other EU countries show that we are uh, doing worse. We are having more problems. It is not the case that had we stayed in the European Union, these problems would not exist. It, is, it, is, it would be dishonest and, and unhelpful to, to think so. But there are two stories here, aren't there? The first is that it's real and it's happening and it's happening to you and I want to know about it. Okay, we've done this once before. And the second, and Will has texted to remind me that a shortage of drugs was, was actually cited uh, uh, by Remain campaigners and labelled Project Fear by Leavers. You're absolutely right. And I, I've mentioned to you before that I... Um, 
I, I, I catch myself having an odd response to Brexit stories now. If you're new to the programme, you may not know that Brexit, in many ways, getting Brexit right, getting every single thing right about Brexit, albeit too late to make any difference to the referendum result, is, is kind of what propelled this programme into a space it hadn't previously occupied. We not only got everything right about Brexit, we developed a, an uncanny knack for attracting people to the program who thought they were right about Brexit, who would then fall apart in quite spectacular fashion. Everyone from Jacob Rees-Mogg down to your Auntie Doris um, would fall apart in quite spectacular fashion because they either said things that have subsequently been shown to be at utter, utter bilge, or they said things at the time which we managed to show were utter, utter, utter bilge. And, and, and oddly, so, so, you know, if you're looking for a Brexit benefit, the only one you'll ever find is my career. And, and, and I say that with a very bittersweet um, tone. But even I now find myself thinking, should we talk about this without mentioning Brexit? Is it unhelpful to bring Brexit into it? It is being cited by independent experts as a key factor in the phenomenon. But the phenomenon is so important to our national interest and to you, to me, to people, to humans, that I feel almost duty bound to find a way into it that manages to swerve the continuing rancor and unpleasantness that, that Brexit brings to the table. And, and listen, I know it brings rancor and unpleasantness to the table because some people still insist that the polar opposite of what they voted for is actually secretly what they voted for, or that there is a good Brexit and it goes to a different school, or that there, none of the problems caused by Brexit are actually caused by Brexit. And, and that's why it's not yet time to be honest about things and start undoing some of the damage. But you, can you have a conversation about Brexit-related problems yet in this country? That's the second bit. That's the second bit of the topic. But it's by far the least important bit, and it's very much a personal inquiry. What I would like you to do now is tell me directly how this affects you. So we know that type 2 diabetes medication, we know that ADHD medication, we know that epilepsy medication have been hit hard. We know that three ADHD drugs that were in short supply were, be were meant to be back in normal circulation by the end of last year, but they are not. We know that lives are being imperiled. We know that health is being imperiled. Patients with serial illnesses, pharmacy bosses warned this morning, are having their health and indeed their potential survival compromised. Charities have seen a sharp rise in calls from patients unable to get their drugs. One says this is the um, head of external affairs at the Epilepsy Society. I mean, epilepsy can be an incredibly debilitating condition, but a miracle of modern science is that it can be controlled. Some people never have another seizure again after their first one. If, it, if it's properly diagnosed and properly treated and the access to medication is complete you, you can never have another seizure again you never stop being epileptic or some patients never stop being epileptic but you never have to have another seizure again because the medication is so effective uh, and this is what the head of external affairs at the epilepsy society tells us our helpline has been inundated with calls from desperate people having to travel miles often visiting multiple pharmacies to try to access their medication so the entire government is queuing up to pretend that angela rayner's tax arrangements are the single and much of the uk media front page of the telegraph today angela rayner front page of the guardian people with epilepsy having to tour the country searching for a pharmacy that stocks the drugs that they took for granted until five years ago four years ago three years ago so i i want to start with stories i want to start with your stories and the lengths you are going to as a patient or the lengths your patients are going to as a doctor or a pharmacist or the reality of your experience as a doctor or as a pharmacist and not just the logistics of it i don't just want you to tell me about the difficulties the saga the 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 the, the journeys that you're making the desperate phone calls the the midnight trips i i want to know from medical professionals what this does to you psychologically i i don't think when you became a doctor or a nurse or a pharmacist 
I don't think you ever thought you would see a day where looking patients in the eye and telling them you don't know where they're going to get their drugs from had become commonplace. Simon suggests that he could treat his diabetes with sovereignty, which brings us back to the much smaller element of this story, which is Brexit. But let's park that for a minute and let's look instead at the reality. So either you're the patient and you can tell me what you're having to do to get the stuff that used to be easy to get. Or you're the healthcare professional and you can tell me what you're having to do to help the patients get the stuff they need that used to be easy to get. But also, also, what it does to your sense of professional fulfilment or even pride. I always try and think of things that aren't immediately obvious when we find ourselves returning to territory that we've explored before. And, and there it is. You, you are a doctor and you are telling an ADHD patient or an epilepsy patient or a diabetic person, you're telling them, well, you need this, but I don't know where you're going to get it. Can you talk me through that, do you think? 0345 6060 is the number that you need. Um, Amelia Cox is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.35 is the time. Um, just a, a quick nod to anyone who was listening yesterday. Bob's been in touch, uh, possibly referring to some of the accents I essayed in the opening to today's programme. Hello, James. Do all your audiobook voices sound like Bob, the clotted cream-selling taxi driver? No, they don't, actually. Some of them are really good. You'll have to buy the audiobook or download the audiobook to find out. Now... When you send me a text, I obviously have no way of checking its provenance. Uh, we, we work generally on the presumption that you're not going to try and pull the wool over our eyes or, or yank our chains. The same is true of callers, although over the years I've, I've developed a, 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 a slightly more reliable antennae with callers than, than I can ever have with texts if, if people are being mischievous or being um, naughty. I, I've got absolutely no reason whatsoever to doubt what Sophie is telling me in one of the first texts to come into the programme this morning. But, I, but I'm just going to warn you, it's, it's not pretty. Dear James, last April, my brother, who suffers from schizophrenia, was sectioned for five months because his antipsychotic medication ran out due to Brexit supply chain issues. His doctor tells me there is no guarantee that this won't happen again. And that is arguably not the most serious story that's already come into the studio in response to a question about drug shortages in which Brexit is a key factor, but not the sole cause, but drug shortages becoming the new normal in Brexit Britain. Billy's in Birmingham. Billy, what's going on? Hi, James. Lovely to meet you. Um, no I work in occupational health. I'm a physiotherapist by, by trade, if you like. Yes. Um, and we deal with um, people who are off work um, in what you might know as absenteeism and also people who are in work, but they're not quite working as, as they could because of the health complaints. That's what we call presenteeism. Yes. And recently I've seen a huge increase in the number of people, um, patients who are reporting that they can't go back to work because their symptoms have deteriorated so much because of a lack of medication that they've always historically had. Now, when you put that on the backdrop of we have so many people on ill health sickness at the moment, you know, you hear lots of things about productivity issues in the country and, you know, get people back to work. And this is all massively intertwined with that. You know, in, in my industry, you learn a lot about the statistics and the facts. And, and there is a, quite a, uh, a body of evidence to suggest that if someone's off work for six months on a medical complaint or issue, then the chances of them going back to work ever are reduced by about 50%. So if the reason for that is a medication oh, um, backlog, man. then that is, some, that is something in, in my eyes which is completely unacceptable. Every newspaper, every right-wing newspaper for, for, for the last few weeks, every few days, have been running a story about that. Running a story about the, the numbers of people, the number of people not working, rocketing. And I don't think I've once read a reference to what you've just described. Yeah, well, the, the field that I work in is very niche. It's very, um, it's a very small community, occupational health. Um, but well, you know, this we, is going to hold true across a much broader cross section of of, of people who who.
can't work for health reasons. The people I'm reading about with the nudge, nudge, wink, wink between the lines suggestion that they're all swinging the lead or skiving or choosing to live mm. a life of indolence. They've probably got flat screen televisions and a Sky Tap subscription and, a, um, you know, tenant super on tap. Uh, th- th- that not once have I read that the failure of this government to address supply chain issues for medication will have contributed, and neither of us can measure how much. Absolutely. But will have contributed to precisely the phenomenon, which, and, and I think, uh, it's here, I've got it. You're not going to believe this, Billy. You th- people think I exaggerate. The front, the front page of today's Daily Express, pages six and seven, sick note Britain to get even worse. Now, what are the odds if we turn to pages six and seven of the Daily Express... Alarm as long-term sick list to top 3.7 million by 2040. Um, what, what are the odds, if I were to bring myself to read this bilge from beginning to end, that the phenomenon you've mentioned and the phenomenon the Nuffield Trust identifies today in, in grisly detail, what are the odds that it gets mentioned at all? Uh, do you know what? I bet my house that it wouldn't. And do you know what? I bet your house as well. Well, let's not get carried away, Billy. <laughs> <laughs> so... Oh man, that's. I, did you know that doesn't happen very often on the program when I actually feel the sort of clouds clearing or a penny dropping as a caller? It's why I paid you the very rare compliment of hardly interrupting at all because that it's not going to explain everything. No one is suggesting for a minute. No, absolutely. But to cover sick note Britain in quotes without addressing what you've just described from the front line is delinquent. It's delinquent to the point of corrupt. So tell me if you could what it's like to 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 to. to I mean, you don't prescribe, I don't think, as a physiotherapist. But, no, but no, I don't prescribe myself. But sometimes the answer is staring you in the face. Right. Um, and it's, you know, these, are, these aren't new medications that, you know, need to go through further testing. These are things that have been used for years. And these patients have had access to them, uh, you know, blip free for years. And now suddenly the impact that it's having on them isn't just that they're in pain. It's not just that, they're, you know, their blood sugars are a little bit you know, up and down. It's actually absolutely debilitating. And you're absolutely right in suggesting that it's not the only problem. Um, No, of course. You you know, but uh, but I think from from what I see, it is a growing problem. And like you said, I've never seen it mentioned um, in, in the conversation. Well, let's 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 pay attention. Let's make sure we pay attention to future conversations conducted elsewhere and see whether or not anybody ever banging on about sick note Britain or, oh, I know some people are ill, but lots of them probably aren't, as ever anyone looks at, especially if they voted for Brexit or if, God forbid, they're in a position of influence and encouraged other people to vote for Brexit. The reason why these conversations can't be conducted is because of the, 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 the fundamental dishonesty and disingenuousness of, of people who aren't yet prepared to admit that they have helped cause these problems. Billy, thank you, mate. Good Lord. I wonder how many other people saw that rabbit when I did, just as he started talking and then de- detailing it. And as soon as he started talking about people who are unable to work for health reasons and, and the health reasons exacerbated and the return to work pr- pr- uh, delayed or possibly even removed from the equation entirely as a consequence of the medication shortages, the supply chain shortages. I just saw it come into focus. It was mad that. Mark's in Bangor in North Wales. Mark, what would you like to say? Oh, good morning. Um, So I, myself and my wife adopted our nephew um, quite a few years ago now. Okay. Um, And through the process, he was, he had a diagnosis of ADHD and autism. Um, He he functions very well. He's very intelligent. Um, And seeing the community paediatrician, they started him on um, a drug, which many people would know is Ritalin. Um, And it started to have an impact, a positive impact on his schoolwork. Academically, he's doing very well. Um, and recently, we've had absolute nightmares trying to get hold of this particular drug. Ritalin? Um, yeah. Do you know, I, it's um, not that long ago that the, the usual suspects were banging on about how they were giving it out like Smarties. The same people <laughs> who are silent now about the supply chain issues affecting the disability benefits or, or sick note Britain are the same people that 10 minutes ago were telling me that they were dishing out Ritalin like opal fruit. It's amazing, yeah. isn't it? So how does it affect you? So I'll try, I'll try and so, park my no, politics okay. for a minute, Mark, and you talk mm. to me about the reality of your nephews or your son. So, Do you call him your son or your nephew now that you've adopted him? Uh, he's a nephew, son. Yeah, I, I slip between the two. Boy. <laughs> my boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, so what's so, what, how's um, it affecting? What's the reality of this situation? So the reality is um, quite recently we had to stop him taking medication at the weekends to oh. make it last. Rationing. Um, 
Yeah, so um, it, 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 the effect really is, it does affect him, but he becomes quite unpleasant. Um, he's difficult to live with sometimes, and that has a huge effect on um, the rest oh, of the kids in the house yeah. and myself and the wife. And, and you know, it, it, a weekend can be absolute hell. And we know it's working because the school reports and everything are saying that he's, he's really doing much better. He's just sat through mocks, which we didn't think he'd ever be able to sit in a room and do an exam. That's and he, he's just done it and he, he, he sailed through it. So, you know, it's, it's so important to him, but it's so important to us as a family as well. And to go around from pharmacy to pharmacy to pharmacy with a script and saying it's not in stock, try somewhere else. And um, it's a controlled drug, so um, the prescriptions have an expiry on them. You, you can't hang on to them for too long. So you really have to get your finger out and, and, and whiz around and try and, and try and find someone who can get, get the supply in. And, of course, um, and, it, I mean, if there was an alternative medication or something like that, then, then you've, got to get on the, you've got to get on the GP um, yeah, the, the appointment, and, you know, merry-go-round, you know, haven't that's you? That's an online consultation. Can you change it to a gen- generic? Yeah. Um, and again, it's a controlled drug. Um, and then, heaven, you know, heaven forbid that the dose is changed, which it often is when we see the paediatrician, he says, right, it's safe to go to the next dose. Then, you know, it, it's another whole... So, so, so you prioritise <laughs> his self-regulation at school over his self-regulation at home. You've been forced into a position where you have to choose the environment in which he's going to, to, to struggle to regulate himself. That's, and and I want you to tell, yeah. I want because I know a bit about this through through some, some of my godchildren actually but but other people don't what's it like for him when he comes down from a a moment when he when he comes down from a loss of control and and he, when he is capable of processing the consequences of what you've just described as being difficult to live with what's that like for him mark um it's it's really hard and i think it's almost it's almost uh, like a shame thing. Yeah. Um, and he's been through quite a bit of trauma anyway. I mean, that's his whole backstory. But, yes. um, y- you know, when you can sit him down and often it's a car journey is the best time to chat with him. Yeah. It, he, he does have insight into it. Um, but it, it's at the time, you know, he's so in a heightened state, it, it, he's completely oblivious. And then for us, you know, it, it can take us 45 minutes just to get back to... Yeah feeling you know that you can have a, a rational discussion with him no, you've got uh, adrenaline he, pumping through your veins as well at the time absolutely the, the whole yeah, fight or flight um, response there's nothing you can do about that and and no. safety issues worrying about other children's safety worrying about his safety worrying about your safety sometimes i imagine yeah yeah oh mate and that's it yeah. so friday nights or, or whatever it is you, you find yourself thinking well we can't give him any tomorrow so batten down the hatches strap in that's it and just trying to stretch out the prescription, you know. Um, Doing a beautiful thing, Mark, looking after him. You really are. I don't know the details, and, and I don't want to, to, to pry, but, you know, you didn't have to step up to that plate, and it's a beautiful thing that you did. Thank you. You take it easy, yeah? Yeah, cheers. Thanks a lot. 10.46. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 10 minutes to 11. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I I mean, it's not quite, Philip suggests, that all of this came up in Operation Yellowhammer, which is true. Um, Operation Yellowhammer looked at what would happen if the UK left the EU without a deal. Um, A hard Irish border and shortages of food and medicine were among its findings, completely ignored, really, by government. Of course, we technically didn't leave the EU without a deal. There there, there was a deal. It was that oven-ready deal negotiated by David Frost that they all tried to disown before the ink was even dry on it. But, But some of the consequences of such a rubbish deal are to be found in Operation Yellowhammer. And, and there it is, in, in black and white, in August of 2019. The UK will face a three-month meltdown at its ports, a hard Irish border, and shortages of food and medicine if it leaves the EU without a deal. I, I don't suppose at the time anybody thought it worthwhile adding um, brackets or with a rubbish deal negotiated by a buffoon like David Frost and signed by the um, human blamange Boris Johnson, close brackets. And of course, a big part of why this all went unrealised or un- understood or misrepresented or lied about was Rupert Murdoch's newspapers, which is why we follow the attempts of people like Hugh Grant and Prince Harry and, and um, Baroness Lawrence and others to hold... Rupert Murdoch's newspapers to account for alleged 
egregiousness, alleged offences that are often filed under phone hacking but involve so much more. It's why we follow these events so closely and it's why we are free, unlike much of the media in this country, to, to report them as in as much detail and as lavishly as we please. 10.51 is the time and it was Hugh Grant's turn yesterday to reveal that he has... Well, I, 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 I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll find out what words Dr. Evan Harris uses. He is, as you know, a former director of Hacked Off um, and a consultant to the claimant's legal team in the news group litigation. I, I, I was going to use the word forced or compelled to describe, having read Hugh's lengthy thread about what happened yesterday. He, 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 I think that's a fair word, isn't it, Evan? He, was, he, he, he feels forced to accept a huge financial settlement from news group. Yes, because quite clear, someone in his position, given his history of campaigning on this and putting it have firmly above the parapet to be shot at by the uh, by Rupert Murdoch's newspapers and their allies in the media, wouldn't want to, uh, wouldn't be shy mm. otherwise of going to court and having his day in court and, and taking his chances on proving his case. But uh, as he set out in his statement yesterday, the the rules of court, the cost rules, which are there to prevent. Um, prevent court time being used when when you can get the remedy means that if they offer a, an amount of money that he simply can't beat in court then the the, the, the rules require him to be liable for all the all his own side's costs which otherwise he wouldn't be liable for and news groups costs and i suspect their lawyers are rather more expensive than hugh grant's lawyers um from the point at which the offer was made until the end of the trial and that's been estimated he says to be 10 million pounds and i don't think that's far off and um although he's a wealthy man yeah. he's clearly not as wealthy as rupert murdoch who can offer him and others what's said to be a billion pounds altogether to avoid the cost of this 10 million pound trial so yes he he, he with regret he said in his statement uh he he has to take the the money which he says will give to charity uh and not 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 um not pay rupert murdoch 10 million because if 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 the, if, if the be an odd outcome it, well well because the, if the judge hands down damages that are one penny less than the offer that was made to the um to 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 to, to hugh Grant in this case then then the, the the person bringing the case what's the right word is it plaintiff claimant claimant then the claimant um, as you say, is on the hook for the entire cost of the entire trial. And, and you know, that would yes, involve the cost. most expensive and cost. So that would be the most the expensive lawyers trial, in the world. Yes. And cost. So, I, I mean, there's a logic to it, isn't there, in that it, it means that you get the result without having to expend the court time and energy. But, of course, crucially, and this is the bit that the man in the street, and to be fair, Evan Harris, the man in this studio, struggles to get his head around. Is yes. that, I, if it was you, if you were the claimant and I was the accused, and I gave you ten million quid to go away, in order to essentially avoid going to court, I, there's no admission of guilt or responsibility. Yes, there's two. So, firstly, in, in any individual case, that there's, I'm not going to argue against the rule that says if you can get justice without using court time and the resources mm. of the court, uh, then you should. And of course, it, it curtails the case, so lawyers get paid less. And so generally, it's a good idea to have a way of ensuring that settlement can be reached. But here you've got to look at the bigger picture. Because there have been, and this is public domain knowledge, at least 1,600 settlements, at least 1,600, 1,600 <laughs> settlements of this type, which, which according to people who've looked at the accounts of News Corp and News UK, which, which publishes The Sun now, um, has cost upwards of £1 billion, that's £1,000 million, in order, news groups say, to avoid the costs of a trial, which is £10 million. Mm. So they could have paid for, on my rough calculations, a hundred trials that they want to, which they say they want to avoid the cost of by reaching a settlement. Because they put out a statement yesterday, and they said both sides felt that it would be in their commercial interests not to take this to trial. But I don't think that's true. It's certainly true for Hugh Grant, yeah. but it's not in the in the uh, interests more generally of Rupert Murdoch, to, I believe, to have these cases tested. Because all he has to do, because he's made, he's made complete denials of anything to do with the sun being illegal, and Hugh Grant's claim, because he'd sued the News of the World earlier, is only to do with the sun. So he could have, for £10 million, 
Mr. Murdoch had a trial, found that his defence was correct. There was no illegality at the sun. Uh, he wouldn't have had to pay that ten million because the claimant would have lost entirely, right? Yes. Not just not beaten an offer, but lost entirely. And then he wouldn't have had to pay this one billion pounds. Now he's a businessman. He must have reasons for not wanting a trial of these issues. And I don't think it takes a great deal of thought to work out why he doesn't want this uh, a judge's ruling on this and witnesses well, come to court. A, a, apropos nothing in particular, I've often read columnists in Murdoch titles suggesting that if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear when it comes to, to um, investigation and scrutiny. Are you suggesting there's hypocrisy in the... Heaven the, forfend, Dr. Uh, Evan clutching, Harris. Clutching Heaven forfend, here. clutch away. Um, I, I, and I suppose the, the question now or the focus now turns to Prince Harry, doesn't it? Who, who was involved in this case, I think, uh, and who uh, is is potentially going to be put into a similar position. Yes, that is true. There's not much I can say about an individual claimant uh, because it's his business. Uh, but uh, obviously he's gone on the record uh, on an ITV interview saying he doesn't intend to settle. Um, I, whatever we can speculate about his wealth and income, it's it's not the billions that the owner of Fox uh, and the erstwhile owner of um, of, of um, 20th Century Fox has. That's clearly not is the that, case. Is that there it, is a then? mismatch. Uh, and it does mean, I think there's a public so until, policy. Sorry to interrupt, but we, I don't yeah. want to run out of time. So Because Elton John, of course, is still in the mix as well. So, so until... For, for so, the Daily Mail. For the, for the Daily Mail. But until, which, which of course, this Part 26 will apply to, to any case, any... any, any uh, um, well, this, yeah. Well, there's, there's two... two there's, yeah. Hang on, let me, let me interrupt you before you interrupt me. So until someone comes along, and, and as you say, Hugh Grant's a hugely successful actor, one of the most successful actors of his, and, and indeed any generation, but, but to, to, to just put £10 million on the table, even if he can afford it, is, is I mean, he's going to stick in his craw. In, he'll win and have to put £10 million on the table. I, I mean, you don't need me to explain. Not just on the table, give it to, to Rupert To hand Murdoch. it over, to, hand, to give it to Rupert Murdoch. So until someone comes along who is either mad enough or rich enough to think, do you know what, I am actually going to spend, to, to get to get to what I believe to be the truth, I am prepared to give the people that have abused me millions and millions and millions of pounds. Until you get to that point, this is never going to be tried in court. It does mean, yes, that wealthy corporations or indeed very wealthy individuals can buy their way out of ever having uh, a court determination of a civil claim. That is the case, and that is the case here. Now, with the Daily Mail, yep. it's slightly different because their denials have been so vitriolic yes. that it would be the biggest climb down since the descent of Everest for them to ever say we're going to settle with even without admissions of liability because they've been pungently oh, okay. rude about if you look at what they've said about the claims of Baroness Lawrence, Prince Harry, yeah. Elton John, and others, I, it, it, I've never seen, and I've seen a lot of these, such strong denials and how this is an outrageous case. And for them to U-turn and start making offers would be the biggest climb down, as I say, in oh, legal that's history. That's a really good point. I, yeah, I, and, I wouldn't and, put it past them. No, no well, I wouldn't put anything past them. But what, what, at what point, when, when does that... Um, push become shoved just in terms of the legal timetables a, a while yet because okay. uh, we're still awaiting the defenses to the to the particulars of claim to the to the claimant's allegations and then there has to be a discovery stage and a trial won't be set until some months or if if not 18 months away you, you, so uh so yeah, we're, so we're, we're in watching early this days well, well we'll be speaking again before then i don't doubt it for a minute and and uh, you probably won't answer this question but i'll ask anyway what what sort of mood was was hugh grant in yesterday when you spoke to him is he sanguine i, I think he saw the writing on the wall for this perhaps uh, yes i mean he, as he said he was frustrated because he doesn't want people to think that he he would shy at a, yeah. a low hurdle, but he shies at giving £10 million to Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> and he has said that he will do his continue to campaign yeah. to ensure that, that justice is done. He just can't do it through this particular claim himself. But he's not the only player, as you've said, 
and um, and um, and this ain't know. over yet. The fat lady has barely drawn breath at this point. The, the cliche has not sown yet. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Evan Harris, former director of Hacked Off, consultant to the claimant's legal team in the news group litigation. And if you wonder why you don't read much about this sort of thing or hear much about this on other radio programs or television programs, um, what Evan said at the beginning of that interview about Rupert Murdoch's empires and his allies elsewhere in the media, or just people who are frightened of him, is a large part of the uh, solution to your confusion quick text i read this and i actually brought i don't I, I, if you send me polite criticism it will work in a way that rude criticism never will so i read this it said dear james i'm a regular listener and i usually enjoy your show i'm not enjoying it as much this morning and, and i looked at that and i thought well why i think the show's been really good today this was particularly funny at the, at the top in my own humble and then i read p.s i'm not the mark menzies that you've been talking about. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. I think if, if, if it was a, a another James O'Brien that had found himself making phone calls in the dead of night, claiming that he was being held hostage in, in very insalubrious circumstances, I probably wouldn't have enjoyed listening to that quite as much as I enjoyed talking about it. Two minutes after 11 is the time. James O'Brien on LBC. I had, had a message from Stan. Stan's been in touch. She says, James, please can you help urgently? I've been locked in a room by some bad people and I need five grand to give to them. Can you get a courier to drop it off, please? What are the rules, Ofcom-wise, on this? Can we, I'm a bit worried about old Stan there. Sounds like it might be a life and death situation. Can we crowdfund for this sort of thing? Can we, can we, can we do a whip round, get five grand round to stay? He's been held in a room by some bad people. <sighs> At least he's not an MP. Um, I, I, I feel duty bound actually to, to to continue with the conversation about drug shortages not least because mark's story was so powerful and sophie's story was so horrifying but also because i think technically we only did about eight minutes of traditional phoning in the last hour and it is a story that deserves attention i i, I know there's an element of self-congratulation when we talk about how other people ignore stories involving Murdoch's empire. But uh, th there's also an element of self-congratulation when we talk about how other outlets ignore stories that cast Brexit in an honest light. But, but it's important, isn't it? It's impo this is doubly important, this story. It's important because you are struggling to get hold of medications that you didn't used to struggle to get hold of. And it's important because we need together to work out how... You have these conversations in in a in a way that how do you break the Brexit spell? You, so you will be listening to this if you if you still listen, and there is a degree of masochism involved in some radio consumption. But your gut reaction, I shall tell you, I use social media rather than calls these days. But you'll get a response to the headline: Brexit seen as a factor as UK drug shortages become new normal. Someone will respond. I guarantee you can go and have a look now at my Twitter. I haven't checked, but I bet my house. Actually, no, I I'd, I'd, I'd bet someone else's house on it. Um, someone will say, "Oh, it's the Guardian. You can't believe what's in the Guardian." And you look at the article, and it quotes the Epilepsy Foundation. It quotes an expert in drugs and drugs industry at Liverpool University. It is. Uh, research conducted by the Nuffield Trust, uh, an independent body of experts. It quotes, I mean, it quotes authority after authority after authority. It quotes the Royal Pharmaceutical Society. Um, uh, everywhere you turn, there are experts being quoted. But if, if you have had your brain boiled by Brexit, you will respond by going, oh, well, that's in The Guardian. And... I don't know how to break that spell. And I think it's really important that we keep trying. How do I break that spell? You, you are determined not to believe that something is true. So you will reach for anything to protect your own shame, to protect yourself from the sense of shame that you will feel when you are forced to acknowledge just how conned you were by people like Nigel Farage and Jacob Rees-Mogg and David Davis and Andrea Leadsom and the rest of them, and of course Boris Johnson and Dominic Cummings and Michael Gove and all the rest of them. How, how do you do it? Because you're going to do it. I'm not going to check, but you've done it already. Oh, it's in The Guardian. You can't trust them. So how do you do it? I don't know. But I'll take calls on that as well. 03456060973. But, but I just, just to, to reset this conversation, patients, doctors, pharmacists, nurses, healthcare professionals... 
the most fundamental tenets of healthcare in this country have been corrupted by a decision to become the first human population in history to impose economic sanctions on itself. You are suffering. You are suffering medically. You consult a medical professional. The medical professional draws upon their expertise to provide you with treatment. The treatment is dependent upon a supply chain that, until 2016, was operating close to perfectly. A story about a seriously ill person being unable to access medication because of supply chain issues, I don't think appeared. It barely appeared prior to 2016. Now... It's been described as, quotes, the new normal, end quote. Uh, 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 in a normal country, this would be the biggest story in town. It would be even bigger than the Tory MP phoning a 78-year-old constituency worker in the dead of night and asking her to send thousands of pounds to help him flee the clutches of some very bad people. It would be... In a normal country, an even bigger story than the deputy leader of the Labour Party having possibly uh, omitted to pay £1,500 in capital gains tax on the sale of a house 10 years ago. It would be a... a, a just think about it for a minute. If the, if the government was responsible, if, the gov if government policy, if an idea supported by every single member of this government had been proven to be responsible for a schizophrenic patient being sectioned because he couldn't get his medication, then the country would be in uproar, or at least the media would be united in its condemnation of those politicians. Every single one of them, even the ones that were just about bright enough not to vote for it, like Grant Shapps. Every single one of them is prevented from telling the truth about a story that sees a little lad with ADHD being told after a, what clearly was an incredibly difficult start in life, being told that the medicine that helps him not get into trouble, the medicine that helps him not do things that he regrets shortly afterwards and then feels shame about for the rest of the day. You can't have it on weekends, son, because we've run out. The epileptic who is driving around pharmacies terrified that they're not going to find the drugs that they need to ensure that they don't suffer from seizures. The diabetic who is worried about the insulin running out. I've got all these messages coming in. And the, the, while there may be problems absent of Brexit, we are living in a country where the government is responsible for one of the major factors behind citizens being unable to access essential med just think about this for a minute this is what i mean about having to wean myself off caution having to think well, why, is, why are we still getting so angry about it? just think about it the secretary of state for health is part of a government that insists that this is all a good idea that this was all worth doing part of a community of politicians that responded to warnings about what brexit might do to medicine supply chains by calling it project fear and telling everybody else to shut up, supported by voters who may now be struggling to get their own medications, but who seven years ago were probably claiming that they didn't need insulin because they'd be able to treat their diabetic with uh, diabetes with remainer tears. We can't let this go. I, I, there are days when I'd like to. I, I've told you before, I see Brexit in a headline now. I don't know when it happened. I used to see Brexit in a headline and I'd start rubbing my hands with glee. Open up the phone lines. We're going in. I see Brexit in a headline now, and there is a little bit of me that just goes, oh, come on, can't someone else do it? Can't some of the people on this radio station who told you to vote for it start telling the truth about what's actually happened? Wouldn't that be nice? You know, maybe spend 10% of the time you spend pretending that Angela Rayner has done something heinous to actually talk about the role you played in preventing diabetics from accessing insulin or uh, preventing ADHD, children with ADHD from accessing Ritalin. Wouldn't that be night? Wouldn't that be news? Wouldn't that be current affairs? Wouldn't that be straight talking? But no, still this tiny, tiny, tiny little constituency of people operating almost exclusively on social media, draw and and the Guardian, drawing attention to something that in any normal country would be a national emergency, a national 
emergency. Um, uh, and, and there it is. There you go. Sue's been watching Channel 5. God knows why. There should be a prescription for that, Sue. I've just watched Anne Widdicombe on Channel 5 saying that Brexit has nothing to do with the medicine shortage. Um, I'm collecting my prescription later, and I wonder if it will be all right. Vicky's listening. I worked for a global manufacturer in 2016. I tried to explain to my Brexit voting friends that manufacturers will not prioritise markets where they don't make as much profit or where trade is more difficult to carry out. I was ignored in my 70% Brexit voting town, and now here we are. Um, Jennifer, who contacts me regularly, but whose messages I don't read out as often as I perhaps should, has suffered from strokes recently. She's had five strokes since January. If I can't get my anticoagulants, I'm dead, James. No suggestion at the moment that anticoagulants are one of the affected supplies, but who knows until you start addressing it. She's 38 years old. And we did this to ourselves. That's why it's not talked about, because you can't talk about it without smashing your head against a metaphorical brick wall with the remembering that it's self-inflicted. So that headline there, Brexit blamed as UK drug shortages put lives at risk, actually would be Prime Minister, Chancellor of the Exchequer, Secretary of State for Health, Secretary of State for Defence, Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, Chief Secretary to the Treasury. Every single member of this government remains committed to a cause which has created this situation and you think i use the words or the phrase client media too much or unfairly this should not be happening and would not be happening in a country where journalists never mind politicians told you the truth about their idiotic support for the stupidest thing that any country has ever voted to do to itself it's 16 minutes after 11 i'm not going to mention politics again all right, Mayor of London is joining us at quarter to 12 um, uh, with, with news about the, the campaign. Not mentioning politics between now and then, all right? Because I just want to talk about medicines and I want you to talk to me. Give me a ring, 03456060973. What's actually happening to you? And I won't mention the politics. I, I needed to get that off my chest because it... <sighs> It, it's it, it's like a blockage. It's, that's why I can't talk about the medicines as, as I, I, the reluctance to talk about it because I, do I want to go off on another mad rant about Brexit? No. Do I have to go out on another? Ma yes, because of what it's doing to you and to yours. So you're a patient, you're a doctor, you're a nurse, you're a healthcare professional, and you can tell the rest of us the reality of UK drug shortages putting health and even lives at risk. 0345 6060 973. James O'Brien on LBC. 20 past 11. Keith, we need a little alarm. I don't want to say the B word again. I just want to listen now till, till at least quarter to 12. And then, of course, at 12 o'clock, uh, mystery hour. Maheen is in Slough. Sorry to keep you, Maheen. I, I, I know you're very busy and I wasn't expecting to go off on quite such a furious tangent, but here we are. Uh, I, I better late than never. What would you like to say? Hi, James. First time caller, but what you've been talking about has really struck a chord with me. Go on. Um, so I'm a GP and basically we have been having this problem for ages now where patients are not getting their medication and they're coming to us, they're taking up appointments because they're not able to get a medication. We're prescribing an alternative. They're coming back to us using another appointment because the alternative is giving them side effects. Then they're phoning again. So we're getting multiple contacts from them. So this is just like Billy was saying, just yeah. like your other callers have been saying, it's having a wider impact on the whole, not only the family unit, their school attendants, sick leave, but also taking up appointments as well. And it's, it's very which, which means that the, and the, 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 the queue gets longer for people yeah, who yeah. need to who who would be seeing you in normal times for more 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 normal reasons, exactly. as in as in problems exactly. not caused by shortages. And how often can you help? I mean, you don't know sitting in your surgery in Slough. You don't know what what's in stock at Boots, do you? Or what's exactly. in stock? Exactly, you're you're hundred percent right. So luckily, I'm in a practice where we have clinical pharmacists. Right. So they normally are aware of what's next available. But if you're in a practice, if you're in a rural practice with no clinical pharmacist, you're having to do this off your own back. So taking up 
time to find what's next available emailing the specialist or writing them a letter, um, phoning around pharmacies. I actually did that just the other week. I phoned around pharmacies myself because I had an epileptic patient who we couldn't get the medications for. He has severe learning disabilities and his parents were really struggling to manage him and his fit. And his medication was not in stock. And it's been amazing. He's been seizure-free for seven years with this medication. And now he's out of stock. So then I prescribed an alternative. But then it starts to give him side effects. His behaviour's not great. He's not sleeping. So he's back in so front of you. you he's yeah, back in front you, of you and the waiting and just, list gets longer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I just said you have to weigh up the benefits, you know, with the oh, side effects. And no. if he's not having seizures, then that is, you know... That's a huge plus. This medication, exactly. What's that like so, for you? I mean, because is it called titration when you work out what yeah, what yeah, medicine or dosage a patient needs? And you, and you, yeah, and, and yeah, you hit and, the sweet spot. With a patient exactly. like him, and exactly. then and then you have to backtrack to a compromise. Exactly, and with epileptic medications, there's different formulations. There's immediate release, prolonged release, right. and they all have different effects, and they all work differently. Um, so this is the issue: is you know when a patient's been so stable on it, it's absolutely so frustrating that this is taking up so much of our time, Good and grief. also it's frustrating for the patient. Like we really feel for them, but in ten minutes, what can you do? I, well, and I, I feel for you, and I sense a sort of frustration is not quite the right word what we need a german word don't we a combination of frustration <laughs> and resignation it's like you're really frustrated but you know there's no point being frustrated because it's not yeah. actually going to change anything and exactly. i presume today exactly. you, you had a bit of a moment when you heard it coming out of your radio because it's been your reality for for, for ages and yet yeah was, i was like i have to call <laughs> yes because it's not being recognized or talked about elsewhere yeah. and every day yeah, i open not- up one newspaper and i'm reading about sick note britain i hadn't even yeah. thought about yeah. school absences exactly. all of these yeah. things could be linked to a failure to get hold of the medication that you need. Exactly. Kids are not going to school when they're not getting these because medications. We're being ADHD. asked to write oh, them letters, God. you know, and that's taking up more time. Yeah. And then, exactly, the whole issue with the sick leave, that is actually having a big impact as well because, and yeah, you're right, it's not talked about, it's swept under the rug. Um, people pretending it's not happening, but this is the reality that we're facing on a daily basis. Well, thank you for doing what you do. And and, and I, I, I can't imagine the frustration of knowing that by looking after that patient with care that they wouldn't need if the supply chains were operating properly, you can't then look after that patient over there who's presenting with, 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 with um, uh, problems in need of attention as quickly as you would like to. And, and just to be clear, I, I, I said I wasn't going to mention the B word, that these are global problems exacerbated by the B word. So, you know, we, we, the government should be pushing harder and harder and harder towards getting it fixed. But it can't because of the role that the B word plays. So even if, if you could blame it all on Ukraine or on COVID inflation, or I beg your pardon, or on inflation or on COVID or on global instability, then the government could get its finger out. But because a, a, a big a big exacerbating factor is their own policy, that the platform on which their entire administration, the last three governments have been built on, they can't do it. They have to pretend it's not there. They have to sweep it under the carpet, which is politics, until... You recognise the demonisation of people who are off sick, the demonisation of children who aren't going to school and ignore completely the role that failure to access medication plays in those processes. It won't explain all of them, but all of those phenomena will contain this reality. Maheen, thank you. Graham's in Southgate. Graham, what made you pick up the phone? I've got epilepsy. Um, it was, It was able to... I was able to, you know, manage it um, probably once a month or two. Um, Because I lost um, my medication, um, and and tablets are meant to, you know, slowly, you know, change to the next one. Um, Because I was able, because I wasn't able to go from one to the next, instantly yeah. um it's affected my epilepsy um i used to like i said one every other month or so um you mean a seizure i think right? it's seizure yeah. yeah i i get four or so a week this is because you've you, you you're struggling to get hold of the medication so you're rationing it more or or, or? i've spoken to the gp i've spoken to my you know my 
you know, my uh, shop. Yeah, um, pharmacist. And there's nothing. They said there's absolutely nothing. I've spoken to my epilepsy specialist. Yes. There's nothing. And I'm it sorry, scares me. Yeah. It scares me. I I have to sleep. Or I have to. I have to have a shower while my wife before my wife goes to work. Yeah. Um, because I don't want to fall down the stairs. So I have to do that before she goes, and I live downstairs. And that's it. Yeah. My son's got you know diabetes and he's lost a lot of his you know a lot of his uh, drugs and stuff and it's it's scary and and you're not and you've tried over and and obviously you're not in a position i don't think to be bombing around the county trying to find a pharmacy that might have it in stock if indeed such a such a pharmacy exists and as Maheen the previous doctor explained the prescriptions for epilepsy are are complicated there's a lot of very different things that can be used slow release quick release is what Graham means when he talks about the tablet as sort of seeing you through until the next one mate I'm so sorry I really am I I, and I and those numbers I think merit repetition is that you've gone from having um, a, a, a seizure every month or two uh, to having four a week um, for the past two months. That's just not fair. 28 minutes after 11 is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. The, uh, I, 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 the reality of it for both patients and doctors couldn't really be clearer, could it? Uh, Ian is in at Corwin in Wales. Ian, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Good morning. Hello, mate. Uh, yeah, but I think they, they've known about this for a long time. Because when Brexit first happened, uh, I my my eyesight went a bit funny on one eye, and I just thought it. Blimey, was I thought eye. it. I thought it affected me, Ian. Yeah, <laughs> well, I've never wore glasses before, and I was nearly <laughs> sixty, so I had good, perfect eyesight. Okay. So I went to a well-known uh, glass provider and they said i had a bleed behind my eye and to go to the hospital right away okay gosh so i i went to the local hospital uh and they said i needed a steroid injection in directly into my eye to prevent what was happening but they didn't have any because of brexit this was a direct quote from the doctor because of brexit the steroid we use comes from the island of Ireland or France and prioritising other medicines so we've got none we will call you back when we get it in so okay I lived with, with the problem for about three four months they call me back, the, and when the I went back good, then they got you in well, yeah and then they called me in and then they called me in for the injection the, the <laughs> lovely and politely told me it's split now. Oh, you need a injection. So, so you've lost the I've you've lost the sight lost, in one eye. I've lost my sight, my eye. So and 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 the response from the, the team was, well, at least you've got one good eye. No, they never <laughs> said that. <laughs> they never you said know. that. No, you made that up. They never. At least, at least you've got the other one. It's not. I mean, crikey. Or, or at least if they did, then they'd obviously clock the fact that you're a fellow with a great sense of humour. But you'd need one, wouldn't you? That's just grim. That is just grim. Ian, I'm sorry, but thank you for your call. Half past 11 is the time. Amelia Cox is there with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. Three minutes after 11 is the time. Um, I, I, that story about Mark Menzies, it's got, it's got, it's got legs. There's, there's more to it than has already been reported, but we will find out. Samantha writes, please, James, tell this gentleman it will get better. It's horrendous at first because your brain still reads from the blind eye and it feels like there's a black hole over your face which distracts you, but eventually your brain will rewire and it's much better. Um, I I'd had an eye stroke in 2016. It is 33 minutes after 11. Mador is in Hillingdon. Mador, what would you like to say? Hi, good morning, James. Hello, mate. Um, first time I'm speaking to you, but I have spoken to Nick Ferrari in the past. Well done. Um, listen to your program very regularly. So, Thank you. Um, I'm a pharmaceutical physician. I'm retired now. Um, more than 
30 years experience in, in the field. Yes. I used to do a lot of research for multinational companies. So uh, I knew a monkey could have told you that Brexit uh, would cause issues with the supply chain. Basically, most of the drug manufacturers have their manufacturing unit outside the UK. Yeah. So the minute you had Brexit and you put barriers there, you're going to have issues with the supply chain. I mean, we knew that the minute this came in, that you would have problems. And this is what you're saying now. It's basically the country putting sanctions on itself. Well, I mean, there are problems elsewhere for, for, for global reasons, but it's like... Uh it's like a magnifying glass, isn't it? It's a, you yeah. show me a problem and Brexit is a magnifying glass. It will get bigger. Or, or actually, no, because it's an eat me potion in, in Alice exactly. in Wonderland. It will actually get bigger. What's it been like for you then, knowing I mean, for, 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 from your professional perspective that this was going to happen? I, I suppose in a way it's nice to be out of the business. You don't have to deliver the news to, to people that you haven't got what they need in stock. It must have no. been a, a, quite a surreal experience to have the most prominent politicians in the country popping up every 10 minutes claiming to know more about the industry you'd been in for decades than you did. Yeah, I mean, if you ask anybody in the industry, they'll tell you that this is expected. This was definitely expected. It's nothing, you know, there's no rocket science behind this. If you put a barrier in the supply chain, you're going to fall short. I mean, it's not just medicines. I mean, go to the supermarket and you see lots of shelves empty. Yeah. Because there's issues about getting stuff from there. Sure, so I'm sitting in, in, in Holland with my either either my tomato company or my, uh, you know, insulin production plant and i'm looking at where it's easier to sell i can make i've got a finite amount of product to sell selling it into birmingham used to be as easy as selling it into amsterdam but now it's much much harder so i'm going to send it all to to to, to, to berlin or to dieppe yeah. or to anywhere in the single market because it, it well why wouldn't i it, 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 it it's it's common sense isn't it i mean it, the the thing is the, you know the question for you james mm. is the previous one of your previous callers said he lost his eye because of a lack of medication. Yeah, and and I know that there are several drugs that are not in the market personally as well because I'm on medication. Sometimes drug, drugs are unavailable. Sure. You can try alternatives, and sometimes even the alternatives are not not available. Yeah, and so then what happens? And who is to be held responsible if a patient dies? because of a lack of medication. Well, Who will be held responsible? I, well, it, it depends, doesn't it, how the information and whether the information gets out. I, I think the claim in the Nuffield Trust is that that has probably already happened or certainly that it's... That, that, that I'm it's sure feasible. it has. What, 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 does the, what does the light at the end of the tunnel look like? I mean, it's like everything else. Either we wave a magic wand and miraculously create our own production capacity or we go back into a single into the single market. I, I can't see well, option three, really, to improve this. Well, your first alternative is impossible. You know, that to put up a manufacturing plant, uh, this, you know, to, to manufacture at large scale that, that medicines are produced, is not something you can do quickly. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the only thing is try and get some sort of treaty going. Yeah. With, at least for medicine. These are essentials. You know, you can do without a lot of other things, but you can't do without medicines that save your life. So no. I think at least get a treaty for, you know, we, we have now some sort of understanding about research projects. Why can't we do the same thing for medicine? Mm. These are essentials. I mean, lift this sanction. On medicine, this is what it is basically. It's a sanction on medicine. Well, they would, but what well, that would be regulatory alignment. But I don't even think they'd agree to that necessarily. And and I haven't heard much from the Labour Party yet about what what improvements they might bring to this situation. So there's no. I mean, drawing on your experience and expertise, Madhu, there's no way, e e even as the, the some of the global problems are ironed out. So the impacts of COVID and war in Ukraine uh, uh, will sort of ease we're still going to be on a worse footing than other countries in the european union most obviously because we can no longer do the do the frictionless free completely free trade yeah i agree and i mean we did have separate regulatory agencies as well but yeah. there was a lot of commonality between that you could you know submit a common dossier to all all the regulators but now you can't do that because of, of the separation. So, you know, we need some sort of a treaty to, to align these things. Uh, and, you know, I don't see a light at the end of the tunnel. No, if, well, I if, don't If you know. do see it, 
Go if on. you do see it, uh, James, uh, it's probably an incoming train. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, let me know. We'll all start running in the opposite direction. Thank you, Mador. Um, Beatrice tells me there's no shortages at all in Italy. I know this for a fact. Well, again, Beatrice, I'll take your word for it. But but I get another text from someone saying, actually, I'm in Italy. And I can't get hold of my antihistamine. So um, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. We haven't touched on HRT, have we? Uh, which last time we talked about this, we only talked about it twice. And I probably didn't get zoned in on it quite as clearly as we have done today. But we haven't talked about HRT, not being able to get hold of HRT or the the lengths that you're going to. Has that got better? Is that that a very small and rare cause for optimism? Has the supply of hormone replacement therapy actually improved? Has that eased up? And and that might possibly have some lessons about how other... um, other drugs might do that as well. 03456060973 is the number if you can help me with that. I, I'm drawn to the uh, 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 Grant Shapps' increasingly desperate attempts to draw attention away from the travails of Mark Menzies and back towards the nothing burger involving Angela Rayner. I may have another little clip of that for you shortly, but um, I don't want to spoil you unduly 20 minutes to 12 is the time nikki's in halifax nikki what would you like to say hello again james hello. um my specialist subject nhs um now i'm going to speak with two hats really um first as a patient um now i'm take a drug called rapinarol which is it's used for parkinson's but also to treat severe restless leg syndrome right. now for those who don't know about it it's basically you take it at night and you get the i get these symptoms at night and um it's to describe it in layman's terms it's like you your head to your hips wants to go to sleep but your legs want to go nightclubbing okay so it's it's quite debilitating and it's what you've got a sudden urge to move and you just can't it, it, the symptom it's like spiders crawling up your legs. That's the only way I can describe the actual sensation. And you, yeah, yeah. How long have horrible. you had it? Um, I've had it for quite a long time. I've had it probably about maybe six years that I know about. Okay. Um, so it's but, not you're not in the same. It's not as, as as severe as some of the other callers that we've had, but it's definitely life changing. It's deeply debilitating. It is, it is definitely because the thing is, if I. Um, I mean, over the past 12 months, I've had problems getting it from my local pharmacy where I live in Manchester. I've ended up having to travel the whole length and breadth of Greater Manchester to be able to find a pharmacy that's open late. And now we don't have that many pharmacies that are open late anymore. So that, that choice is actually narrowed down even more. And because I don't finish work until say six o'clock i don't have a lot of options available and, and previously previously it was a piece of cake yeah yeah i didn't have a problem um now the problem is is that if i don't take this medication i can't sleep um right. simple as that um, because with me working as a nurse that scares me because obviously i'm making decisions you're going to be tired yeah at work. exactly and to go with the other hat i'm actually a nurse prescriber Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, and I um, have um, patients in my kidney clinics who take medications for things like blood pressure, um, uh, medications to be able to offload extra fluid that they would normally, um, when they go to the toilet, get, get rid of as urine. But if that is not able to... If you're not able to get rid of that, then that has a knock-on effect where they end up becoming short of breath and becoming getting admitted to hospital. And if um, <laughs> the more patient, we talk about this, the madder it becomes because it, it does. Well, I'm, I'm reading all about some of the end results of these problems without any mention of the contribution that this issue makes to those problems. I'm not suggesting for a minute that we can explain all the waiting lists and all the sickness, uh, all the sick notes and all the school children not going to school by, by pointing to a shortage of medicines. But my God, they must play a part in the story. And yet somehow yeah. we've ended up in a place where people try to make enormous capital out of the victims of these scenarios without actually looking at all of the causes. Yeah. It's madness. Yeah. Who do you worry about most? Who, who are the hardest people to? I mean, who, when, when you're prescribing, who, who are the people? Um, that... Well, I had I had a lady recently who um, 
had she she was in so much pain because she had so much swelling to her legs um, because of the amount of fluid that she wasn't able to get rid of. And I'd seen her um, for I'd seen her the first time, and then I brought her back in a week so we could titrate her medication. Mm. Um, and she was in tears, absolutely in tears. Now the thing that scares me about that particular, I guess if you could look at it as a scenario. Um, is if, you know, I wasn't able to help her. I mean, luckily I was able to, yeah. and the, the medication that I've prescribed was some of the common things that you would, um, you know, like you get your, your initial medication that your pharmaceutical company develop, and then you get your, your smaller companies who are able to take on that license and be able, and you get them from different companies every time you get a script. Hey. Um, yeah, so luckily... That you know, that's not too bad. But if it's something, I guess, like for epilepsy, etc., and there's a specific brand that works for these patients. Well, we've already then, heard. We've yeah. already heard from the the, the trade off between the, the not being able to get the optimal medicine and having then to decide what's better, dealing with the side effects of the suboptimal medicine, or or, or watching an increased risk of seizure. Do you know? I, thank you, Nikki. Take care of yourself. I, uh, you, you remember the, the I forgot the fellow's name what was the name of the, 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 the caller who, who had a bleed behind the eye and uh, he I mean, clearly um, possessed of a very good sense of humour suggesting that uh, having lost the sight in one eye as a consequence of delays Ian said that, the, that some of the people treating him said don't worry at least you've got another one and and I don't know whether you balked at that. You thought I thought two things. God, that's a bit brutal. I hope that didn't actually happen. Or if it did, I hope it happened in the circumstances that Ian seemed to convey that it would have been in a an air, an environment of levity and lightheartedness. What do you think the Department of Health and Social Care has said about these shortages? I think I could I could be misreading this, but I think they've done the equivalent. Uh, they've essentially said, um, well, there's loads of medicines that are in good supply. So they've been presented with the research showing that shortages have become the new normal. The allegation or the accusation or the, or the fact that these shortages are putting lives at risk. The description of it as a shocking development that few would have expected a decade ago by the lead author and the Nuffield Trust's Brexit programme lead, so the, the, the man charged with watching the effects in particular of Brexit being given a list of drugs, whether ADHD, type 2 diabetes, epilepsy, HRT, although that seems to be uh, seems to have improved since the last time we spoke about it, being given a list of all the areas in which these shortages are acute and even dangerous. And the Department of Health and Social Care has responded by saying there are around 14,000 licensed medicines and the overwhelming majority are in good supply. So if you really need diabetes medicine, right, um, to the point of desperation, uh, and you can't get it. Don't worry, because we've got we've got absolutely loads of blood pressure tablets. That that's what the Department of Health and so I'm not misreading this, am I? They're saying, well, we've got fourteen thousand medicines. The overwhelming majority are in good supply, so I can't get any epilepsy treatment. But don't worry, because we've got loads of fishermen's friends. I know that fishermen's friends aren't actually a. Uh, um, a, a, a prescription medicine but sometimes you read things and you think it must be the problem must be with you I must be missing this I'll tell you the last time I noticed that was when Evan Davis was interviewing Laura Trott on the PM, PM programme on, on uh, Radio 4 I've, I've written this up the paperback comes out a week today actually I should have mentioned that sooner I've written this up for the paperback because I, I listened back to it two or three times when Laura Trott Chief Secretary the tre to the Treasury revealed that she didn't know what percentages were or, or certainly had no idea what the relationship between GDP and debt was inevitably un, 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 under Rishi Soon actually still in the job but listen, listening back to it, Evan, who I think is a superb journalist, he did that thing that we do sometimes where he thought, well, hang on a minute. This is so mad. It must be me. You can hear it in his voice where he goes, no, 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 debt, debt, debt's gone up. And you've got the chief secretary to the treasury sitting in a studio going, debt's come down, debt's come down. And he's, and he's looking at the numbers. You can hear him going, I must have missed, I, mu I must have got this wrong. Because there's no way a Chief Secretary to the Treasury would be sitting in the studio saying the stuff that I think she's saying. 
but but she was, and you hear the penny drop with him and the, and the increased confidence that, no, it's actually the chief secretary to, to, to the Treasury who doesn't understand the relationship between GDP and debt. I, this is a bit similar. Is the Department of Health and Social Care really responding to news that diabetes medication, epilepsy medication, ADHD medication are in chronically, dangerously short supply by telling us, no, but there are lots of medications that aren't. I, I, do you know what? I really think they are. It is just coming up to 10 to 12. James O'Brien on LBC. 11.52 is the time. Um, do you know, you, you mentioned Laura Trott not understanding what GDP is, or at least the relationship between GDP and debt, and it, it turns out that she's been, she's been at it again. Great news for people at home. We saw inflation coming down. Crucially, we saw food prices coming down. And this hasn't happened by accident. This has been a result of the government working very hard with the bank, with the Monetary Policy Committee, to make sure we've got these uh, inflation rates coming down steadily now. Uh, real wages are now rising and people can have a little bit more money at the end of the month. And that's really good news. Just to be, to be clear, um, because I think you misspoke just then, mm. when you said prices were coming down, did you mean prices are going up? Sorry, the rate of uh, the, well, which prices are rising are coming down. So, uh, so inflation uh, is coming down. Yeah. Inflation Food prices are still yes. going up. Yeah, I think yes, our viewers find it. Five, can yes, you just explain this to our... 4% and not 5%. So just explain this to our viewers. Uh, you say inflation is coming down, and people say to us, I know, but the prices of goods are going up. So just explain to our viewers how those two things can be true. So real wages are rising and have been rising now for the last eight months. And that's really important because it means more money in your paycheck at the end of the month. And that is looking at uh, wage rises and then taking away the impact of inflation. So that is really important. The prices are going up. Prices are going up. Prices are going up. So she begins that interview by saying that prices are coming down and ends it by saying that prices are going up. Um, I, I, I suppose there's one other element of the conversation about medicine that we haven't touched on. And, and I'm very conscious of this. I always remember doing an NHS phone-in back in the day. And I think it was when sepsis was first in the news. And I, I, I got a message. It was a text, not a phone call, from a, an older lady because she's told me her age. What is the age at which you start telling everyone your age? And I do it a bit on the radio for context so that you understand where I sit generationally on an issue like the smoking ban. But, but once you reach a certain age, you tell everyone your age all the time. He's like, I'm, I'm 86 years old and I'd like to talk about football. I don't know why that is, but I, but I know that she was an older lady because she would have told me her age. And she said, I'm due to go into hospital this afternoon and now I don't want to because... Uh, uh, of what you've been saying about sepsis and stuff like that and I'm always conscious of not wanting to frighten people um, we're not going to have long are we but I believe the Labour mayoral candidate Sadiq Khan is on the line in Greenwich today for the launch of, of the mayoral manifesto um, I, I suppose we should start with the headlines Sadiq Khan what, what, are the, what are the big pledges that you're making for in a bid for a third term well, good morning. It's great to speak to your uh, listeners about the, the election in 14 days' time. And uh, what I've announced today, if I'm re-elected on May the 2nd, we'll be making universal free school meals permanent. Uh, every uh, mother on a maternity ward when she leaves will receive support from a baby bank, you know, nappies, uh, essentials, uh, toiletries. We're going to be building 40,000 council homes by the end of this uh, decade. We're going to end rough sleep. And we're also going to be invested in the police and in youth clubs. And the key choice Londoners have in 14 days time is a mayor who will make free school meals permanent, or one that will end them. A mayor that will keep fares down, or one that will hike them up. A mayor that will invest in youth clubs, or one that will close them down. A mayor that will clean up our air, or one that, that wants to return to pollution. A mayor that unites our communities, or one that divides them. So it's a big choice Londoners have, and I think this will be the closest election in the mayoral history in London. You, you've had eight years to do all of these things. Well, the real uh, reason why this year is so exciting is it's what I call a moment of maximum opportunity. Well, I, hang on, I, I, mean, I, I want to know why you, haven't, why you haven't done any of these things over the last eight years. We've made real progress in all these uh, things. Uh, seven months ago, I announced free school mills, uh, first for one year, and then for two years, I can now announce I'll make them permanent if we're elected. Uh, eight years ago, I began the process of freezing fares in our city. Five of the last eight years, they've been frozen. They're now frozen uh, for the next uh, year as uh, well. 
Uh, I began the renaissance of council house building more than any time since the 1970s. How, how many but will Angela, have been built by the time uh, the ballots open in 14 days' time? Under your mayor, uh, how many between 2016 uh, and 2024? The number of uh, genuine affordable homes that have been built is roughly speaking 70,000 pounds. Th- 70,000 homes. We had a deal with the government for 16, 116,000. We smashed that record. 23,000 council homes over the last uh, few uh, years. I'm promising 6,000 new rent control homes uh, as well. But the really exciting prospect, as I said, was for the first time in a generation, a Labour mayor working with a Labour government will be transformative. Um, I, your Conservative candidate, Susan Hall, has pointed out that, in a way, uh, if my children were still at a state primary school, their lunches would be subsidised by people who earn considerably less than me. That, that there is a, a, a form of natural injustice built into that, she suggests. Yeah, well, listen, James, God forbid if you got run over by a car, even though you could afford to pay for your health care, uh, you'd get treated by the A&E at the local NHS hospital. If God forbid tomorrow... Uh, you are unwell, you can go to your GP and not pay for the privilege of uh, doing so, the right to do so. I think universalism is, universalism is really important. Look, uh, I'm somebody who benefited from means-tested free school mills. I don't remember the mills, I remember the stigma and shame. Uh, I enjoy speaking to teachers who tell me that children's uh, performance has increased hugely since they had a nutritious free school mill. Uh, parents telling me about how rather than falling out with the school because they're chasing up uh, the, the fees for the mills, they're, they're now getting on with the uh, school. So free school mills doesn't just lead to you know, parents having less stress, less anxiety, and it's been a lifeline to parents during the cost of living crisis. It's lead to better attendance, better productivity, but also a situation where you can sit cheek by jowl, breaking bread with the child of somebody wealthier than you, which is really important. Let's let's look at one of the other pledges. Rob Blackie, your Liberal Democrat rival, has um, picked a few holes, or thinks he's picked a few holes, in your freeze fares pledge. It excludes daily and weekly contactless caps and travel cards, which are among the most popular ways for commuters certainly to get to and from work every day. So 80% of those people who use tra- public transport in London will get the benefit of the freeze. The reason why the remaining won't is because that's a deal done by the government with the privatised companies, what's called the TOX. So when you buy a travel card, you don't, you don't just get the benefit of uh, TfL services, you also get the benefit of the privatised TOX and the joy of a Labour government is just like we can freeze fares on TfL, we'll be making sure those privatised companies also freeze their fares too. No, no, I mean, the freeze fares are very, all very well, but the experience of travelling on the London Underground is the worst that it's been in the, in the uh, nearly 30 years, that, uh, more than 30 years that I've lived in London. Nothing in your manifesto to sort of increase services or to uh, improve the number of trains on the lines or, or to address particularly the central line, which can be a bit of a... a, a, a nightmare at the best of times. Well, I'm pleased to tell you that we'll not, not only be having uh, half a million pounds spent on refurbished central line trains, new trains on the uh, DLR, new trains on the Piccadilly uh, line, uh, a new Baker Loop line going from uh, Elephant and Castle to uh, Lewisham. I'm announcing tomorrow a super loop uh, at two. Fares being kept uh, low, increasing frequency of buses across uh, our city, millions of kilometres of new buses, particularly in uh, outer uh, London. Build on the progress we've had in the last eight years at the Elizabeth Line, uh, Northern Line Extension, uh, London Overground uh, Extension, uh, but also making sure we continue to improve public transport, keep it affordable, accessible and safe. I, I saw also that you've signed up, because I think, I think you were invited to do so on this very programme, to the, to the Reform Political Advertising's pledge to make every reasonable yeah. effort not to mislead voters. Just, just a word, if you would, on, on why you did that. Well, listen, I, I want to thank uh, the caller who rang in. I think the last time I was on speak to uh, uh, City, I've seen over the last few weeks the consequences of lies, misinformation and disinformation. Uh, videos purporting to be of a station in London, but lo and behold, there are a station in New York called Penn Station. Uh, mocked up images of street signs, which aren't really street signs. They're basically mocked up images to scare people into voting for the Conservatives. I've seen the consequence of being dishonest and being disingenuous, and I'm not willing to do so. Of course, Susan Hall, your Conservative candidate, is more than welcome to, to, to address those accusations uh, with me on this programme at her convenience. And you will be with her and indeed Rob Blackie Zo- and Zoe Garbutt of the Green Party at a hustings on Tuesday on Tom Swarbrick's programme at 5pm. Um, Sadiq Khan, the, the Labour candidate for London Mayor, many thanks for your time. Remember, you can see a full list of candidates at lbc.co.uk slash candidates. Um, I'll say that again because it's really important and I get into trouble if I don't. You can see a full list of candidates at lbc.co.uk slash candidates. I'm going to tell you a little secret. (laughs) I 
I, I was going to ask Sadiq Khan to contribute a question for Mystery Hour, and I thought that was quite a funny idea at nine o'clock this morning when I came up with it. But as I, I, I sort of saw it on my note, and I just thought, that's going to sound really childish. You're 52 years old. When are you ever going to grow up? It's Mystery Hour next. James O'Brien on LBC. Six minutes after 12 is the time. Um, I, I, I mean, this is almost mystery hour territory, but I, just to correct a couple of things I said earlier, the, the, the tale of Mark Menzies hiring a Brazilian sex worker who had been refused entry to the country on at least three separate occasions is not part of the new scandal. It turns out that this fella has been scandal adjacent now for some time. There's another story about the police being called when he had allegedly got a, do- a dog drunk um, and then engaging in a in a street brawl. He wasn't charged because he successfully persuaded police that he hadn't fed the dog alcohol and he did this by showing them photographs of the person that he'd been fighting with feeding the dog alcohol instead. Um, I, I, there is a book I'd recommend actually called The, 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 the Decade in Tory uh, which really goes into encyclopedic detail about all these sort of things and of course rather begs the question of why the party has sat on it, if you pardon the expression, for so long. But anyway, that, that's just one mystery that we won't be solving today. That, I mean that. Don't ring in and try and solve the mystery of why the uh, conservative politicians who've been pretending to care passionately about Angela Rayner's tax affairs from 10 years ago have been absolutely silent and only suspended this Mark Menzies fella over alleged misuse of funds when a journalist reported the story. They didn't do it when they found out about it. They f- did it when it got when it got reported. So don't ring in about that, because it's mystery hour, okay? And I need to remind you what that means. I'm just building up a bit of tension. Two things. The first is you can win a mystery hour board game, uh, the most glittering prize in the history of British radio. It has been suggested. In fact, last week's winner posted a lovely photograph of himself with it, which. Um, Warms the cockles of my heart, actually. And you do that by being my favourite contributor of the week. It's no more complicated than that. And uh, 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 my decision is final. And the full terms and conditions are at lbc.co.uk. And the second thing you need to know... Uh, oh, and you can find your own Mystery Hour. If you don't win one, you can buy one at mysteryhour.co.uk. Which reminds me, I must remember to plug the paperback of my book, which comes out on Thursday with a new chapter and indeed an index. And the index is real. I've never had anything as grown up as an index in my books before. But it means that, you know, when you're trying to find that little nugget of information about a politician getting a dog drunk or something like that, and you know you read it in my book, but you can't find it, you can just go to the index, find it, and then lo and behold, you'll get all those little argument-winning um, items of evidence, nuggets of fact that that, uh, that we all love so much. Um, but the second thing is, actually, there is no second thing, really. You're not supposed to repeat yourself, but there aren't really any other rules. And don't ring in with questions that we've already answered. I've done the TNCs are at lbc.co.uk. I've already mentioned that. So you, well, I, we always used to think there were two things I had to mention at the top of Mystery Hour, but now I, now I can only think of one. You know, we usually forget the rest. You're not supposed to Google anything, but that's fairly obvious. Um... No, we'll crack on. Nine after 12. Dane's in Stoke-on-Trent. Dane, question or answer? Question, please, James. Carry on. Why is it that when long hair is tied up into a single piece, it's called a ponytail? Yeah. But when it's tied into multiple pieces, it's called pigtail? Because they're shorter. But it doesn't look like a pig's tail, though, does it? Well, it depends on the breed. Well, I'm more sort of thinking it's like a singular plural thing. I've got a young daughter, and it occurred to me the other day that whenever we tie her hair back, we only ever use ponytail as a singular yeah. and pigtails as a plural. So it would be as a plural. You wouldn't. We can't have a single pigtail. Pigtails, it doesn't feel like it. it doesn't what, seem, so, we, I mean, we what's the say, difference we, between a pigtail and a ponytail? Answer singular and plural. Yeah, so why is it not ponytails? Because that doesn't feel right. Ponytails. Pigtails. I mean, <laughs> pigtails doesn't actually make much sense on any level because, as you've correctly pointed out, there's not much resemblance to a pig's no. tail and because they're not curly I mean a pig's tail is curly isn't it if I, if memory serves or curly-ish yeah and, uh, yeah pon- ponytail does look tail. like a horse's tail but pigtails don't look like pigs and yeah why is it the sing- why is the one there's a lovely the question here and- there's a lovely yeah. question I'm not sure we've nailed it down yet Dane well, I'm, I'm thinking, why is ponytail singular and why is pigtails plural? Is what's okay but that, no, but that's that's a question that contains the answer or an answer <laughs> that contains the question. Isn't it? I mean, because it is, it is. So no pig has two tails. No. It looks like a ponytail. 
coming down the you know the center of of of, of the back of the yeah. head I, well, I, I put it yeah all right so i i big but why why pigtails uh, this, is what, this is how i'm going to do it dane all right i'm going to do it like this okay. pig pigtails ponytails why <laughs> keep it simple yeah okay. exactly that and I, I like that so then they can answer whatever question they want as long as it involves pigtails ponytails why anthony's in blackpool anthony question or answer yes hi james hello anthony my question is um do cats retain memories of traumatic events why do you ask i ask this yeah i ask this <laughs> i thought you might ask <laughs> I, I i ask this because i was at a cattery about a year ago yeah and it went missing for two weeks from the cattery no yeah, That's unfortunately, not, I won't go. I won't go into detail. No, I well, um, weren't happy about that, were you? And we haven't turned it back to the same category. I'm not um, surprised. But it was in an alien environment. You know, it was in a semi-rural area, quite a distance away from home, so it would have been very foreign to it. Mm. And we were fortunate enough to get it back. How did you it, get it? How did you get it back? Well, my what? It had a blanket. <laughs> there was a blanket that we used to have on the settee, yeah. which my dog would often lie on. And right. the dog is very good friends with this cat. Oh, that's nice. So yeah. the smells were on this blanket. Yeah. So the people at the cattery got hold of a trap. Right. Um, not you know a, a cruel trap. A no, no, no trap, like a cage. Obviously, trap. yeah. I didn't. We didn't. We didn't want to. Yeah, not a, not a snare. <laughs> not a snare. I mean, not, not an illegal sort of. <laughs> sprang, got you. No, a, little, a trap. A trap. 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 It, it, it wouldn't have been great getting the cat back in that condition. No, certainly and not. They put. They, they, were, they were in enough trouble as it is, Anthony. <laughs> That's right. They, we got the uh, stay for free at least for yeah, the dog and two cats. But yeah. you know that was neither here nor there. It was very. So upsetting. they put the blanket um, in the cage and it tempted the cat in. Yeah. So they knew I mean, the cat was around. The cat hadn't gone far. It hadn't tried yeah. to get home, for example. Yeah, yeah. We've been we've been searching around late at night. Oh, I've been apparently there. Apparently, a cat's first uh, thing is, is is safety. Yeah. And if they hear people, and if they're rattling their favourite treats, they'll hide away. Ours so, came yeah. out for one of my girls, you know. Been missing Sorry? for ours came out for one of my girls. It'd been missing for about a week, and we got a report from yeah. not not that far away but it had been bonfire night when she went when he went missing so that that, that you know there'd be trauma there oh yeah that and, makes sense and so we went we took the cage with us and we all were walking up the road only about half a mile from where we live but not, oh, not, wow. not on a route we normally go on and um my oldest whose cat it is um was just calling him and he came to her Oh, my word. And we'd already... I mean, I'm not going to lie to you, Anthony. I'd given up hope, but I hadn't shared oh. that. I hadn't shared that with the family at the time. Mrs. O'Brien, the optimist in our relationship, had been putting oh. leaflets through letterboxes and all sorts of things, oh. and up on the local Facebook group. But yeah. I thought after yeah, a week, here. I thought that's it. But no, it came uh, to her James, call, came to her voice. Apparently, they can go missing for up to a year or more. And, and still and know then, what home is. And, and, and then still be rediscovered, yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? So what we want to... Do you, I mean, do you think there is evidence of trauma? <laughs> um, no, it's not apparent on the surface. I think the only difference in behaviour I've noticed, we've noticed, is that I think that he stays in a little bit more. Well, that's, he still goes out, yeah. but it, it, it's not as ad, quite as adventurous. It'd be quite it's scary, a, wouldn't it? It's more to, of a home bird. Yeah, but, you know, nature, you don't have that refuge it'd be like us really you know we had to sleep rough we'd probably Absolutely. be a bit traumatized by it so i don't know how, how will we know how could we answer the question I, I, that's another question isn't it and, yeah. I, and that might be the answer that we don't oh yeah go cool. it's gone my, a bit my, philosophical my question is does he retain any does any he know does he have like a form of feline ptsd yeah, I mean, my, my dog remembers houses where he's gone past and he's been given a treat. <laughs> yeah, no, no, ours does, does too. It gets a, gets a sniff in her nostrils and she'll go bonkers. I like that yeah. question. I like, I like that you. a lot. Also, we, we've you. got, well, it's lovely to speak to you. I've, our cats and dogs are friends as well. It's nice, that, isn't it? Yeah, well, one of them is. Uh, one of the cats hisses at uh, our dog when, oh. the, when the dog's been to the groomers and had his hair trimmed. Doesn't recognise <laughs> doesn't doesn't recognize him. Thinks he's a stranger. <laughs> thinks there's a cuckoo in the nest. <laughs> <laughs> haven't got a cuckoo. Thank you, Anthony. It's 12.15. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 17 minutes after 12. The, the, the cats retain trauma. And pigtails, ponytails, why? Tony's in Chingford. Tony, question or answer? It's question, James. Hello again, how are you? Hello, Tony. Very well. What's the question? Uh, yeah, I was reading a book by Bill Bryson last week, and there oh, was yeah. a chapter in it about when uh, the pilgrims went to America. And they tried to get on really well with the Native American Indians in the tribes. 
Uh, but it turned out they couldn't un- they couldn't communicate in the Indian language because it was so harsh. Right. There was so few vowels language sounds in it. So I was wondering, what is the harshest, least vowely language in the world? So, 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 so like all, all sort of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was all like was Keop like, in well, Battle of the Planets. Yeah, a bit Klingony. Yes. No. <laughs> so I, I, the, of... the, the least vowel sound. I mean, would anyone be able to answer that? Is it the kind of thing that linguists measure? Um, I don't know. Actually, I don't that's know. What I, I was wondering. Least... Uh, it just struck me as um, they did actually find two Indians that could speak English, so there was all right after all. But how, was uh, that? how did that happen? Oh well, one of the Indians, a guy called Somerset, was actually Somerset. 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 Sorry. Yeah. yeah. It actually. Um, taken as a slave and he ended up spending nine years in i think it was coventry or something i don't know Good <laughs> anyway, Lord. He, and he suffered enough and then he went back and, and, and <laughs> still had yeah, the ability the first, i haven't read that book i like bill bryce and i thought I'd, i don't remember reading that one um yeah, i should tr- try and find out for you what was the other one called the other one that could speak english samasa and um, devon uh Sato. Or something. I'll, oh, I'll yeah. pronounce that wrong. But That's all right. It's got too many together. vowels in it. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. That's what we want the language with the least amount of vowels, please. On 0345 6060 973. Or vowel sounds, because the language concerned wouldn't actually have vowels in it, but what we would call a vowel sound. So uh, if I speak French, if I say je parle français, there's lots of uh, vowely sounds there, isn't there? Uh, Simon is in I- Icaria in Greece. Calimera. No, oh, is it Calimera? Is it what time is it there? Yes, yeah, Calimera, it's uh, 20 past two. 20 past two, so it's Calispera well, then, Cali, almost. Calispera. Calispera. Yeah, Calispera. What's question or answer? Yeah. It's a question, James. How are you doing, by the way? Can't, you all right? Can't complain, can't complain, Simon. Etsy Ketsy. What's What have you got? Yeah. <laughs> Etsy Ketsy. Etsy nice Ketsy. <laughs> come see, come sir. Yeah, that's all the right. one. So look, yeah, my, my question is this. I've often wondered about it. When when Rangers and Celtic play, or, or the other way around um, <laughs> in, in Glasgow... Why did? Why is it called the Old Firm Derby? Good Lord, I should know that. Well, I thought you might. Yeah, but you don't, I don't, do you? no, I don't. You're absolutely <laughs> right. Dexeron, uh, <laughs> Horis, yeah, no, yeah I cracky. No, I thought what the Old Firm. Oh, no, I was trying. I was uh, trying to say no idea then, but I forgot what oh, right. idea was. Yeah. I, so I, I've uh, got the Horis bit. Right. That would be no, wouldn't it? I don't. I, yeah. no, but I forgot what idea was. Um, yeah, you're on. Yeah, what, I like it. What right. are you there? Right, yeah, no, fairy stop pulley, Simon. Carlo Taxidi. But I see you soon, mate. You will? Well, you won't, but it's a figure of speech. 21 minutes after. Well, you might. I, I mean, who knows? I, I, I get to Greece most summers, but not, not your career. John's in Shepton Mallet. Um, in, oh, in Somerset. Uh, you, uh, yeah, there's a slave named after that. Well, question yes, or answer, John? That. Question or answer? Yeah, well, I said, well, I'm not going to sacrifice my question, but I could have answered the last, uh, last question. No, but yeah, yeah I'll give you I bet my you could. question. Go on then. Yeah, my question, my question is when the interest rates of the Bank of England go up in terms of, let's say, mortgages, yeah? Yeah. So when my mortgage, and I'll just use you know, easy figures here, one thousand pound. Yeah. And the Bank of Interest uh, the Bank of England increased the interest rates. Yeah. And let's say, just to make it easy, it goes up to fifteen hundred pound. Does my retail bank, let's say Barclays or Bank of Scotland or whoever it might be, yeah. have they instantly made a windfall of five hundred pound? Say that again, sorry, I got a bit distracted. All right, okay. Forget about the old firm for a moment. No, it wasn't that. Go on. All right, okay. It's this Mark right, Menzies so... story, John. People keep sending me new things about him, and I keep I got to, I might close my screen and concentrate properly. Go on, what? Right, okay. Right, so when the Bank of England change, change interest rates, yeah. yeah, so specifically let's use mortgage. So if the mortgage is £1,000, yeah. and because of an interest rate rise, it goes up to £1,500, how do no, but how? Back, hang on, it, 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 that's the bit where I got confused. It had, it, your mortgage doesn't go up to fifty. You mean your you mean your payment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Right. So the, your the, monthly the payment, payment yeah. goes up because of the interest rates from a thousand to fifteen hundred. Yep. Yeah. So has the has the retail bank, whoever you've got at West, you know, Barclays or Bank of Scotland or whatever, have they instantly made a five hundred pound additional profit? No. Why? 
I'm not sure. They were, they were making a profit on a thousand pound. So why is the Bank of England changing their uh, base rate? Change the retail because they are paying out more on the money that they are holding in savings as well. Well, they are because we know that it's not the same differential, is there? No, it's uh, not. they're very slow to react on the on the uh, the savings aspect. Um, but even if you took that into account, there's still a, a bigger differential between the two. And so there were, is it a windfall, no, windfall tax? But no, OK, say, I, get, I understand the question. I'm embarrassed by, I mean, I was embarrassed enough not to know what the old firm's all about. But I've, I've been, so somebody somewhere just makes money when interest rates go up. It actually seems yeah. quite yeah, feasible. Well, well, the bank or the shareholders or whoever, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah you're on. I, I, right. know, I know they probably don't, and it's probably more uh, No, it probably isn't. But it, it probably isn't. But, That's the problem, but, isn't it? Me, is it? We think it's all complicated, and it isn't. Otherwise, how could Jacob Rees-Mogg make a ton of money in the financial <laughs> yeah, market? Yeah, but there you yeah. go, exactly. Yeah, yeah just, but it's just that, yeah, from £1,000 to £500, what happened to that £500 that I'm now paying to Barclays or Bank of Scotland or whoever? Yeah. Yeah, great question. Cheers, John. Uh, no worries. 12.24 is the time. Bob's in Kennington. Bob, question or answer? Question. Carry on. How did ships that were uh, sail power travel up the Thames to the docks? Well, by sail power? No, if there was no wind. Well, you didn't say that, did you, Bob? <laughs> if there was no wind. On a calm day, they are, from they're... the estuary up to the St. Catherine's docks, so, and likewise back again. They'd have a few oars, wouldn't they? No, but I'm talking to you know, like, like, um, yeah, they'd have a few, they'd have a, few, they'd have a few oars. Do you think? Yeah, I, I wondered if it was tidal, but surely that's for emergency. Well, the t- oh, well, if it's specifically the Thames, it might be tidal. I am taught, yeah, specifically the Thames, but, but then you know, I imagine turning into but that, that's what I mean. Stuff. There is no wind at all, and you need to set sail. But I th- do you know, actually, Bob, we, we both missed this, I think. <laughs> No, I'm not. I'm not yeah. even joking. I think they wait for the wind, mate. You could be waiting for weeks. Well, that is why it was very hard to give a, an accurate time of arrival for <laughs> sailing Possibly. ships. I, I suppose that says for departure as well, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, you re- you remember that that you know the, I, I read a lot of fiction from sort of 17th century set crime fiction, and, and you, you, there's always someone who's invested his life savings in a slave. Ship and they, yeah. and then they're, they're down at Bristol Dock every day, hoping it's going to turn up. They've got no way of knowing whether or not it's going to whether he's going to come back with his fortune or whether he's going to be in penury. You're right. <clears throat> so, so, so you can't make any predictions based on wind accurately. So, I, I, I mean, well, wait, I'm putting it on the board, but I think that we were thinking about it in very 21st century terms and presuming it has to set sail at two o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, you're going to have to give all the passengers a refund. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you'd wait Possibly. for the wind. You'd wait for the wind to come up. I, I, I think I'm reading that in in one of S. W. Perry's book recently, where the the Italians there's only a certain type of day where they can set sail, and it will be partly because of tides yeah. and partly because of wind. And if the Possibly wind doesn't turn up, then the tides don't matter. Because like the Cutty Sark hasn't got holes for holes, does it? Or, no, I think know? my that. Let's pretend I never said that bit. If it's all right <laughs> with you, with your permission. <laughs> Granted. Thank so, well, you. lovely. Thanks, James. Oh, I love that question. Thank you, Bob. 1226, how do the sailing boats get up and down the Thames if there isn't any wind? If indeed they do. Simon's in Littlehampton. Simon, question or answer? Hello, James. It's a question for you. Carry on, mate. Um, we were watching a fairly newish drama, 12, um, the other week, yeah. and there's a courtroom scene. I think it's set in New Zealand. And the courtroom scene with Sam Neill had... Oh, I um, love Sam. The I love him. It was superb. And the judges are wearing white wigs, which oh, then yeah. made me ask, oh, is the white wig a worldwide thing? No. And so why only the two countries then? New Z- well, it New wouldn't Zealand be. I, but it's probably other Commonwealth countries as well, no? I mean, it go- I think it goes back to Charles II. Right. There's a lot of wigs around during that uh during the restoration um the wigs were meant to be as a disguise weren't they that the judges didn't get recognized in the street i think so i'm pretty sure because i mean we've watched some big cases in america haven't we and they don't wear wigs yeah that's true 
So, it's so, that, so that's the answer to your question. Is it is it worldwide? No, because like, there are plenty of countries where you don't wear a wig. But does it extend anywhere beyond the, the sort of New reach of, of UK England. law, British yeah. law? I, I don't think it does. I think it's a peculiarly British thing. Yeah. Commonwealth. I'll put it on the board. Well, I'm tempted to take a round of applause for that one just because of... Well, I think you should. I do too. I'm just wondering... What are the well, country? I'm, I'm, I guess the well, I might allow a steward's many, inquiry on it, but but you know, o, o, qualifications. I was watching the O.J. Simpson trial the other day when when yeah. when, when when the fella died and they they re-showed it, and he definitely had no wig on. Judge Judy yeah. doesn't wear a wig. No. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, I'll okay. take it, but but it may it may it may be improved subsequently by someone. I think. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see what countries do. Yeah, exactly that. If it if it does extend beyond the Commonwealth, thank you, Simon. Ian's in Dorking. Ian, question or answer? Hi, James. It's the, it's an answer about the cat, Carry basically. On. Yes. Um, I suppose widening his question, it's the question is, do cats hold grudges? Yes. Um, is is an allied. Um, question and they absolutely most certainly do oh. um, they certainly um, it will depend on the cat's um, experiences in life and if they've learned to be quite chilled out about the challenges that life throws at them then um, le- things are obviously less likely to traumatize them some of them will be um, quite irrational in what they consider is a traumatic event. Yes. Um, but we do, um, certainly in, in the cat world and in the veterinary world, we do kind of focus on trying to make cats' experiences of things like going to the vet as, as non-traumatic as possible so that they want to go back next time or they, they tolerate going back next time as opposed to... Um, so having just, a hissy, hissy fit about well, things. Yeah, really. I mean, they're learning. That's learning, but it doesn't mean they're traumatised. It just means they remember not to trust that fellow over there with the massive net. Um, yeah, fair point, James. I think I've, I've certainly met a few that were, were permanently traumatised. Um, yeah. A scatty it's, cat. It's a, it's a scatty cat. It's mm. a sliding scale, I, I yes, suppose. It is. But, um, so the but cat, so be... Anthony's cat, on, on, <laughs> on, on, I mean, you know, lost in the wilds of Lancashire probably mm. would have been a bit like you said he's less like he goes out less now because he's he's frightened of, it's like somewhere there's a memory of 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 not knowing where he was and being all scared and so he has been traumatized by that yeah they, they I, do, so. I mean they do a lot of their learning in the first sort of nine weeks of life as kittens and they, they're very much hardwired at that point um but they will you know by negative association they will it's learned behavior almost i mean yeah, it's, it's, it's actually were you listening last week uh, I was, and I wasn't able. I've never been able to answer one of the. Cat there, questions there was one before, of our so. favourite questions last week. The first question last week was, "Why are pheasants so stupid?" And in some <laughs> ways, in some ways, the answer is the same as yours about cats, because pheasants are bred for shooting. They don't get the chance to learn about danger. And in fact, if you're running a pheasant shoot, the last thing you want is a pheasant that understands danger. So it'll be flying <laughs> off in the opposite direction at 100 miles yeah. an hour, not going anywhere near the guns. And they don't live. If a pheasant actually lives out one season, it will develop an ability to stay off roads for example or that it becomes less likely to get run over so in a way it's the same it's the same answer isn't it so two very different questions mm, and they're also i mean they aren't they aren't solely predators they are mid food chain so cats of course they are cats are prey animals as well as predators but they're, they're bodily designed um they, they, they don't have the compensation in their in their evolution that a prey animal would have like a rabbit with the eyes on the side of the Got head it. No, I hear so you. they're in this permanent state of neurosis because Sounds they have to overcompensate for <laughs> to overcompensate for not having those those prey animal Love characteristics it. qualifications uh veterinary nurse and nicely. work work for a cat charity <laughs> can't say fairer than that round of applause for Ian please <laughs> um I hope Anthony is is satisfied with that answer I certainly am Tim Humphrey is here with your headlines James O'Brien on LBC <laughs> 35 is the time. Normally, Mystery Hour is sacrosanct, but I, I confessed earlier to uh, John, I think, asking the question about interest rates, that I had allowed myself to be distracted by more and more detail of uh, allegations against Mark Menzies, the Lancashire MP who, as you just heard in the news, has now been suspended as a trade envoy. Where was he a trade envoy for? Goodness me. Um, 
I, so I'm going to read you this one as well. More recently, Menzies's Lancashire constituency has been abuzz with gossip about a drunken incident at the last night of the Proms concert featuring Catherine Jenkins, held in the grounds of Lytham Hall in August. Menzies, who was invited to the event by the local mayor, is said to have turned up intoxicated and got into a row with other patrons after discovering that seats had not been reserved for his party within the VIP section. One attendee said the MP started kicking the chair. I get that right. One attendee said the MP quotes started kicking the chairs and poking the people on the front row. Right now, pay attention because this gets very funny towards the end, creating a disturbance for ticket holders who had paid £150 each for the event. He was spoken to by security and appeared to be heavily intoxicated by the end of the concert. A source close to the MP acknowledged that he had had too much to drink, but said he hadn't intentionally poked anyone and may have done it by accident when waving a flag. Kiz in Cumbran. Uh, question or answer, Kit? <laughs> it's an answer. Go! Oh, ow! Stop waving that flag! <laughs> Tories will Tory, right? Yeah, so. something like that. Go on then, what have you got? Oh, it's about the interest rates. So, oh. um, yeah, the guy was asking whether yes. an increase in the rate would be automatic profit. It doesn't quite work that way because the banks will go to the other institutions and pay the going rate, which is directly related to the rate that the Bank of England set. So it's called a libel rate. You might yeah. remember the scandal a while ago. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. they all just go to the markets and borrow a load of money at that rate and then lend it out. But obviously, as the um, base rate changes, the rate that they pay will change. So it's not like they just go to the market for your little tiny chunk of mortgage, and therefore, when the rates change, they make a profit on that. It's a whole bank of, uh, of money that they agree a rate on when they buy it, borrow it from the market. But then obviously, as the rates change, they pass that on. So it's not a direct uh, relationship between the, the rates and the profits. It kind of there's a bit of a lag. So it's but not, they will it's make so a, when interest rates go up though. However, although they're not going to get all of John's money, it is. I mean, for a retail bank shareholder, that would be good news, would it? <laughs> it's, it's six and two threes because obviously they'll make uh, more money from the the, the savings potentially because they pass that on too. But yeah. they borrow your money and then invest that. So the yeah. chances are when things are going well. Even though they're paying you more on your interest, they'll be making more in profits for the underlying investments they got. But, yeah. but with regards to the borrowing, not really. It no. doesn't really matter because they'll have their fixed margin and they'll just pass that on. Whether it's so it keeps getting there, go keeps going down the line. So where does that yeah. five hundred pounds end up? If you if you to take John's question back to source, oh, it ends up in the ether through the markets because obviously the inter inter rates. Yeah, everyone gets their slice of it, so it doesn't just end up in. It does, one go, it does go a bit mad, money, doesn't it? Once you push the questions, yeah. where does it go? Look, I pay thousand pound a month, and now mm -hmm. I'm paying fifteen hundred pound a month. Where's that five hundred quid a week next Tuesday? That's a really good question. Nobody knows. So basically, it, it, because Unlikely. the whole system is in, interconnected. Yeah. Well, you, you don't forget you're, what the, what you're paying is money that they borrowed a long time ago. Yes, so of it's not it's not it's not a direct thing. So, it, but it's it's like a whole pool of money. Yeah, like. yeah, yeah. So, no, I get that. So the answer is going to be it's, it's it's a notional destination at some unspecified point in the future is where it's going to end up. Probably some offshore Tory account. Yeah, <laughs> <You don't know laughs> behave that. yourself. Um, <laughs> uh, qualifications? Uh, financial advisor. You can have a round of applause. I, I, I think, you know, there might be room for embellishment or improvement, but I, I, I can hear people zoning out, which is part of the problem. It's why Martin Lewis is so adamant about why we need better financial education at school. 12.39 is the time. Uh, Alan is in Stewarton. Uh, I could have a guess at which one you're going to have a crack at from Ayrshire. Uh, question or answer, Alan? It's an answer, James. Carry on. It's, it's, it's an oddly controversial question, this, isn't it? Which perhaps the questioner didn't well, even realise. Well, it, it could be controversial. Yeah. Go on, it then. could be. Okay, so the term originated uh, early in the 20th century between an early meeting of the two teams where the commentators actually described the game as like a meeting between two old, firm friends. There it and is. And that's where the term stuck from. That's pretty strong. That gets you a round of applause. Qualifications? Uh, Celtic supporter. Why... Why... Did people get in touch to say that, that this didn't apply after 20... Well, I forget exactly what year it was. 2012. Basically 2012. what happened is Rangers embarked on massive tax avoidance 
and the club was liquidated. So out of the grave of the old Rangers came a Phoenix club known as Sevco PLC. So yes. the old firm has basically died and in its place is now the Glasgow Derby. But the phrase still persists, doesn't it? Well, it's or not. one half of Glasgow. Oh, OK. That's interesting. Round of applause. Thank you. Welcome. David's in Brom. Actually, I should remind you of some of the other questions that we're looking for. So, ponytails, pigtails. Why? Uh, cat trauma, we've done. Which language has the fewest vowel sounds? Old firm, we've done. Interest rates, we've done. How do sailing ships get going when there isn't any wind? Brackets, if indeed they do. And does the does the bewigged judge... Is that is that peculiar to British law, British Commonwealth law? I don't think it is. Lots of people tell me French judges wear wigs as well. So what's the reason? What, what, what's the difference between a judge who wears a wig and a judge who doesn't? I'll embellish that question ever ever so slightly. That's all I've got at the moment. 12.41 is the time. And David is in Bromley. David, question or answer? Uh, it's question, James. Good afternoon. Yes. So I want to tread very carefully here. I do not want to cause offence to anyone whatsoever. So um, I want to put that first. Okay. Uh, there's a people group that were once known as uh, Red Indians. Yeah. And I just wanted to know how and where that originated. I know that's not the correct term. And No, I mean, so perfectly. You don't need to tie yourself in knots on this. Native Americans um, we're talking about, or, 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 or American Indians. Is it indigenous? Yes. Is it, does it, does it, does it, because what you've got, you've got the Indies, haven't you? You've got the, uh, but I don't know what is chicken and egg, what came first, the, the Indies or, in now, yeah. no, not, not, not at yeah. all, but the, no. what came first, naming the, yeah. the territory, the Indies, or naming the people Indian? That's that. I don't. Yeah. I don't know. The sh is the short answer to that, or, or whether no, I, or not I, it's a it's a complexion reference. It is just a, a lazy yeah. language to describe exotic foreigners, some of whom had brown skin if they came from the subcontinent, and the ones that we encountered, the ones that were encountered in the New World, had um, yeah. different complexions, which they chose to describe as red. So I, I don't know where does the what's the origin of the phrase red Indian? There's no there's nothing to worry about there, mate. That's a perfectly yeah. reasonable question. All right, thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. I shall put it on the board. 12.42 is the time. Uh, Chris is in Margate. Chris, question or answer? It's an answer, James. Carry on. Uh, so it's the answer about, for the question about how the sailing ships yes. um, go up the Thames when there's no wind. Um, so uh, you're quite right in saying, you know, when there's no wind, there's no wind, and a sailing ship isn't going to do very well when there's no wind. Yeah. But there were numerous techniques that they could use. So the big ships um, would often use like berthing boats um, or I suppose like an old style of tugboat, which would just be a bunch of strong crew members in small boats, um, small rowboats in front of them, and they would just row these enormous ships. Because it's like, it's like Britain's strongest man, isn't it? it I mean, what, once you've got a tiny once bit... Once you've got it going. Yeah, once you've got it going, it's a lot easier than it sounds. And they would yeah. do that... By tugging, yeah. So they would they would tug the the big ships in, which is um, in, yeah yeah okay that makes sense. Yeah, but the um, the Thames barges, which um, were going up and down the Thames um, all the time, bringing cargo in, um, they actually developed a technique uh, which was called drudging. Oh yes, um, with the anchors. So, so yeah yeah. So what you'd do is you would um, you'd use the tide rather than the wind, and you would wait for the tide to be going uh, up the river if that indeed the way that you're going yes and you drop your anchor at the front but not enough that it's going to take hold and stop you from moving so it's bouncing along the bottom yeah and then with the force of the tide that anchor just keeps you uh facing the, the oncoming tide and you can use your uh your rudder to steer you as you go backwards with the tide and you've just got a just enough control from the anchor uh bouncing along the bottom of the, the river was it um is it difficult to do? Is it quite tricky um, to get the hang of? Uh, judging is uh, quite a difficult technique. Uh, just knowing how much uh, anchor to drop down so that it does just bounce along the bottom is what you don't want yeah. it to, put to completely hold. And of obviously, course. these these old ships didn't have a um, have any sort of hydraulic winches for getting the anchor up and down. So you're relying on manpower to to winch it back up again if you haven't got it far enough, or if you need to put a bit more down. Qualifications. 
Uh, so I'm a barge mate on a uh, on a Thames barge, and we still often sail up the Thames. And uh, some of the barges don't have engines; still don't have engines in them. So um, often have to figure out ways of getting up. Was that a family? Them. Is it a family thing? Were you born into? Is it? You... Uh, no, no, no. I'm a I'm a member with the Thames Sailing Barge Trust. Okay, um, which is based in Malden, in Essex. We've got two barges. Um, and we, we, you know, we still race the, the Thames barges on the Thames. I remember that. Uh, yeah, I've seen that. I've seen the races. Mm. So, 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 do you still compete for Doggett's coat and badge, or is it something else? <laughs> um, so there's there's um, there's a whole load of silverware because the the Thames sailing barge match um, is yeah. actually the the second oldest sailing race in the world after the America's Cup. Wow! Uh, but wow. the difference is we're still using the same boats that were used when it was first started. So blimey. You might actually say that it's the oldest sailing race yeah. in the world. Yeah, but certainly in terms of what actually goes on, it is just the name isn't yeah. quite as old as the America's Cup. I love yeah. that. That's a yeah. perfect answer and a, and a well richly deserved round of applause. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. I love the Thames. I, I, I know that sounds a bit partridgey, but I really do. I, it's it's it's, it's it, 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 always. I've lived near it now for absolutely yonks, and I'd, I'd really, really miss it if I didn't. My favourite bit at the moment is is up with the old boatyards around Brentford, where if you squint, actually come back a bit, Chris. Is that is it true that you know the really fancy boat that they get out for the Royals on special occasions? Oh yes, the Gloriana. Where's that kept? Uh, well, it was kept in um, St. Catherine's Dock, but I was in St. Catherine's Dock just a couple of not, days ago, yeah. and it's not it's not there anymore. Do we know um, where so it is? It's, it's been moved somewhere. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, you know, it's mostly polystyrene. No, I didn't know that, and I wish you yeah. hadn't told me. Oh, sorry. That's uh, all right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's I just mean, not going to feel beautiful. the same next time, is it, going it's, past? There goes that polystyrene <laughs> boat. Yeah. That sums up pageantry in a way, doesn't it? I it don't want to get all, all Republican about it, but the royal family's been mostly polystyrene for years. Yeah, yeah, so very the, true. I heard a rumour they kept it in Brentford. I think I think you might be right. Yeah, I think it might be. I've, I've got a theory where it is. I think they um, keep it in a very nondescript... I know one of the barge skippers was, um, was tasked with moving it. Not right. so long ago. Lovely stuff. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's um, it's mostly carved polystyrene rather than like that's uh, then just been painted gold. Do you know? It's funny you say that, right? Because I, I I've got a gate post that needs a thing sticking on top of it. Right. And they cost thousands. They, man, there's no earthly way I'm paying what 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 they charge for one of these things. Yeah. But it has to match the thing on top of the other gate post. Right, so you're thinking polystyrene. I, th- I said to Mrs. O'Brien, let's get one made of fiberglass or polystyrene right. or something like that. Who's going to know? Yeah, yeah, who is going to know? If you clip it, obviously then, you're going to yeah, have a bit of a problem. Of it, you're gonna, yeah. yeah, but but until so I might I start. You've you've, re, you've reinvigorated my <laughs> idea. Did did Chris get a round of applause? Did we give well done, Chris. Thank you. I covered a lot of ground there, quite unexpectedly. Some of it. Twelve forty eight is the time. James O'Brien on LBC. 12.51 is the time. These questions still need answers. Ponytails, pigtails. Why? Uh, what language has the least vowel sounds than the ships? Wigs and judges. What's that all about, eh? And why were Native Americans known as, or, or Aboriginal Americans, indigenous, indigenous Americans, why were they known as Red Indians? 03456060973. Will's in Camberwell. Will, question or answer? Answer. Carry on, Will. So it's the one you just gave. Christopher Columbus uh, headed west to find a route to India, stumbled across uh, did, yeah. Cuba, and thought he was in India. So he called all the people he met Indians. At the time, they would obviously have been quite tanned and quite um, West Hemisphere in the yes. sunshine and stuff. And they have they looked different to him, so they were called Red Indians. But pretty straightforward. I like that. Pretty straight. And people up in Oka, which is up in the Canada, they literally put red up on this in for war paint that kind of thing oh cool so um so the name stuck. stuck uh qualifications um it was a couple of years ago i got nothing else was on the telly i watched a load of uh, youtube videos about the history of the native americans and i'm not a hugely emotional person but the trauma that they suffered really really got to me and um i sort of looked into it and read about the history and all the the way they like to be addressed was an interesting thing yeah. my understanding is they like to be called by the tribe they're members of, so Lakota or Navajo or Cheyenne. Yes. It's had some, and the older generation quite like Indian because it's what it sort of stuck as. Okay. Um, Native American is a curious one. I'll 
concluding because if you look on YouTube, there's a really nice YouTuber guy, white Italian American guy. He speaks to an old medicine man. Says, "Don't call me Native American. You're a Native American too." Okay. I, I to you, am a Lakota. Lakota, which, which refers to, I should try and remember that. I, I, I think I'd say I'd probably have the same response as you to stuff like that. I'm trying to remember what the phrase is on the New York Times crossword, because quite often tribes come up as key, c- clues because they've got a disproportionate amount of vowels in them, which is always helpful to people ah. setting crosswords. Right. But I, I can't. I can't remember. But but you've just said some of the answers that come up, like Cree, and is it Ot Ot or o- Yeah. Yeah. That's another one of them. But I can't remember what the clue is. They give the clue, and then it could be one of those various answers. But, but yeah, don't know. Double that. You've covered a lot of ground there. Perfect qualifications. Round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Victoria's in Eppingham. Victoria, question or answer? Answer. Carry on. This is not an academic answer. Just as a mother of three daughters, it's the pigtails, ponytail thing. Right. I would say that you would only say pigtails if they're little toddlers with little ringlet bunchies. So they've Mm. got two um, uh, ponytails, so bunchies, but they look like pigtails. They're fine hair. It's it's curled. Um, But then once they get past that stage, you say bunchies. I've never heard the phrase bunchies in my life. No. Bunchies? Yeah. Bunchies, so got... yeah. So you get two bunches of hair and that's it. But it's, it's not like a bunch. It's a, it's, it's a ponytail coming out the side of your head. Two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, bunches. Yes. No, I thought you said bunchies. Well, well, me and your um, person who called me, we were just debating it. Am I getting it wrong? But most people, I think we say... Oh, should we do hair and bun cheese? But I think it's actually I've bun never cheese. never heard bun cheese before. That's bun cheese? Sounds, bun. Sounds, I'm a, sounds inappropriate. I don't <laughs> want to go come on my programme with your bun cheese. Bun, <laughs> bunches. So my sister had her hair yeah. in bunches when we were kids growing up. Yeah, so you're right. I so think, the pigtail. I you I, do you know what? I, by, by Jove, I think you're yeah. right. I actually yeah, think you're right. Really, and it looks like little pig's tails. You'd never and say pig's tails to, 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 to a sort of... 12 year old would you no that and even, would be like, bunches. even I say up three and upwards really it stops so once the hair gets thicker and straighter I think and, you've I, I think you've bloody done it Victoria these, these mums we know our stuff I, I, because that and, and so actually the whole premise of the question was wrong because they do look like pig's tails yes they do and it's just two pig's tails a round of applause thank you beautifully <laughs> done thank you 12.55 is the time Mike's in Winchester Mike question or answer um, answer. Carry on. Um, it's regarding the question about the, the languages with the, the kind of least amount of vowels and the, the highest amount of consonants. Um, I wanted to put forward Adige, which is a, a Circassian language. Um, so, for, for example, I think uh, we hear about Boris Johnson's great grandfather who was Turkish. And I think his mother was Circassian, but otherwise they're not very well known. Okay. Um, but I know that Adige only has three vowels, which, if I'm correct, is essentially just a, e, and a, uh, um, and then there's about 55 consonants. Crikey. Um, so or rather cracky. I, I, I think one of the big reasons for that is because they have they have what's called a lot of adjective consonants. So whereas, um, you know, for example, in the word paper, we would just pronounce a p as as we would pronounce oh, it. Close. They. Yeah, so they say uh, or if they're saying the curse sound in car, they they could say car. Uh, it's where like a glossal like stop. Clicks, like clicks, uh, like Bedouin click type things. Yeah, yeah. Do but you not quite... speak it? No, I don't. But I've I've looked into it in great detail. Well, I want to um, hear it now, don't I, Mike? <laughs> well, I could give. You, I mean, for example, they also have the the uh, sound, which is in Welsh, famously. Um, but they have an objective version of like that. A, so have the, like a chlan yeah, like, 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 <laughs> like that. Yeah. And these are all... Yeah. I like this. I, well, I'll tell you what. It's a contender, isn't it? Adige. Mm, it is. But it you is. don't know. You're um, just offering it up as a possibility. You've got no reason to think it might actually be the mothership of, 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 of low no, vowel, I mean, low I vowel just language. From, correct. I mean, I just know from being a sort of um, amateur linguist and hobbyist, I know that it's, it's quite... You know, it's regarded in the field. It's it's quite sort of special, really. It's up there. Yeah. It's, it's, it's yeah. there all the way. You can have a round of applause. You've told yeah. me your qualifications. Amateur linguist. <laughs> That'll do nicely. What's the difference between an amateur linguist and a professional linguist? Getting paid for it. 
Yeah, I, I don't get paid for this, no. No. <laughs> I mean, oddly, that makes me a professional radio presenter, but who'd, who'd have thought that, eh? Uh, Paul's in Manchester. Paul, question or answer? Answer. Carry on. Uh, Wigs. Yep. Uh, the inheritance that we have uh, for Wigs in this country is basically from, you're quite right, Charles II, 17th century. Gentlemen wore wigs. Uh, aristocracy was associated with the aristocracy. So the inheritance across the Commonwealth is that quite a lot of countries have wigs. We have Australia, New Zealand, some provinces in Canada, several African countries, Kenya, Zimbabwe, Botswana. You see it in the Caribbean. Qualifications? Uh, uh, KC. Kings? Well, I'm the Sunshine Band, or are you a lawyer? I haven't got, and I'm not KFC either. <laughs> um, why do they wear, apparently people have seen French judges wearing wigs. No, wrong. You're wrong. Whoa, it, it okay. contradicts. It contradicts the principles of egality. They abandoned it years ago. Is that right? Oh, so someone's watching a historical drama, probably. Yeah. It's, it, Maybe. It, it, it's also, I didn't check, Paul. I, I didn't check when they said they'd seen a French jug wearing a wig. It might just have been for vanity. It might have been like a toupee. Uh, who knows? Um, it wasn't a legal the, the ridiculous, wig. The ridiculous situation we have now is in the Court of Appeal in England, uh, you have the judges just wearing gowns and the barristers wearing full bottom wigs and silk gowns. Crikey, that is a bit ridiculous. But it's earned you a round of applause. Thank you. There you go. Uh, Victoria wins this because that just, I love the way that call just veered from me being a bit snarky and sniffy right through to me realizing she was completely right. And also saying bunchies on the radio. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back on Catch Up on I'm 52, you know. <laughs> I came in a bit early just in case you needed help. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't quite sure what I was hearing when you if, said bunches. If you catch up on Global Flare, the official LBC app, where you can also pause and rewind live radio. Download it now for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Coming up at four on LBC, it's Tom Swarbrick, but now it's time for Sheila Fogarty. Thank you. James O'Brien on LBC.